calling this hearing to order already. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat and um, thank you for attending uh, yet another hearing on the port congestion. Hopefully the maybe this can be the last one or if there's yet another one, it can already be our final one. No? Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank um, all the representatives who joined the ocular inspection. That proved to be very informative and very helpful. And again, we would like to um, thank um, both ATI and ICTSI for hosting us no, during the um, during the uh, ocular inspection. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge the um, members present. So first of all, let me acknowledge the um, head of Task Force Pandalan and of course our CABSEC, Secretary Rene Almendras. Good morning, sir. Uh, we have um, Undersecretary uh, Dimagiba. Good morning. Uh, we have Miss Army Cecilia de la Cruz of DOTC. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Renier Donez of Alianza Agricultura, FPI, among others, among other groups as well. Um, Mr. Raul Santos, who is representing PPA. Ah, yes, Mr. Santos, no? Uh, Mr. Santa Ana cannot join us today. Ah, okay. So he's not in the country. Okay. We have um, Mr. Barclay uh, from the Manila North Harbor Port. Mr. Barclay, good morning. Mr. Carl Fontanilla, the Container Depot Association of the Philippines. Yes, Mr. Fontanilla. Okay. It's good that you're here. Is this the first time you've attended our hearings? Yes, no, it's good that you're here because uh, it seems the container depots also play a very important role in the port congestion. No? So thank you for coming. Uh, Mr. Swan Singh, of course, from our Truckers Association. Um, Mr. Roiber from the uh, ECC, ECCP, yeah, good morning. Uh, of course, Henry Schumacher, good morning. Uh, Ms. Mary Zapata of the Aduana Business Club. Uh, from DOH, we have uh, Mr. Emmanuel Labella and Mr. Alan Pasumbal. Yes, good morning. You're invited because it seems DOH also has some quarantine activities at the ports, no? And uh, we're looking at all the processes no, to get the goods in and out, so that's why you're here. Uh, Mr. Christian Gonzalez of ICTSI. Uh, Christian, good morning. Uh, Mr. Teddy Hervasho of the... Uh, Transport Integrated North Harbor Truckers Association, Mr. Vasho, good morning. Mr. Sean Perez of uh, ATI. Ah, there, you can join us, uh, Sean. Just uh, pull up a seat. And uh, Mr. Olego of Hatao. And this is another truckers group. Mr. Olego, good morning, Paul. Um, and uh, Attorney Louis Tan of Actuo. Good morning. Magandang umaga. Okay, so... Yan po yung ating cast of characters. And again, um, we'd like to mention that we're here to do our best no, to be able to solve our issues at the port. Kung tutuusin po, no, yung issues natin sa port is not only a uh, economic issue, it's not only a consumer issue. Uh, I would like to think it's an issue of national interest, especially since... Um, this will affect the trade in the Philippines, the prices of goods, and these are all things which are important to the Filipino people. So I'm hoping that um, through our hearings, we can get better coordination among the different parties and at the same time see where we should go moving forward. No? And we've always characterized these hearings as having a short-term component and a medium and long-term component. So we're going to start with a short-term uh, component and maybe get an update from the ports. Uh, and later on, move towards medium and long term. And of course, at that point, we'll open the discussion to to everyone here, no, to to share their insights and possibly also, um, since I understand that um, it's not all the time that we get to see each other face to face, uh, maybe it's also time that we can also um, ask on each other the different tasks that we need to be able to solve our issues. No, so we're gonna start with um, Task Force Pantalan. So, Cabsec, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Senator Baum. Thank you, and good morning to everyone who's here. Just to update you, uh, I was asked to just give a brief overview. The cabinet cluster assigned to address the problem have, has actually had a total of 37 meetings since February. So it's almost every week there's something happening. 
uh, on a number of times we have involved certain sectors of the uh, of the problem, both from local government and the stakeholders at the Port of Manila. Um, briefly, Your Honor, the problem, as we all know, started with the truck ban. Uh, it became quite complex, and honestly, it was only when we began to realize that uh, the only solution, there were, there were palliative actions trying to address the truck ban. But eventually, when we realized that a significant volume of cargo was actually going to the immediate vicinity of the port, which was really Binondo and the city of Manila, that accounted for 33% of all imports going into the metropolitan area, we were constrained to go for a lifting in its totality of the Manila truck ban, which we are very grateful to the Manila mayor President Arab having done so. When that truck ban was lifted in its totality and we were back to the old truck ban of MMDA, which admittedly was significantly more liberal, the efficiency of the port operations and the throughput have significantly increased. Um, Your Honor, I don't mean to preempt the presentation of ICTSI and ATI, but both operators will show there has been a significant improvement in the throughput of both imports and exports. We have reduced the uh, backlog. The problem on why we could not predict exactly when that backlog could be solved was there was a significant volume of containers that were held at the overseas ports. Uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Kaohsiung, and Singapore actually uh, held back some containers knowing that there was a problem here. But in the past few weeks or month or two, we've seen the volume significantly increase. And again, uh, both port operators can give an update as to the status of the backlog offshore because we have requested them to talk to the shipping lines. The good news, um, Your Honor, is that there has been marked improvement in the efficiency resulting in better throughput, despite the fact that uh, last week we only had four days of uh, what the, the other week when we had a holiday on a Monday. The total volume moved that week was very was even be, was equally as good as the previous week, even if you had a one day holiday. So, again, um, both port operators will show you the volume that's increased. The challenge today, Your Honor, in our view, is uh, is not no longer as technical as it was, meaning no longer an issue of how fast we can move cargo into the country. Um, I'll ask both port operators to update the committee later on the waiting time of the ships, which has significantly reduced to a few days from where it was before. We believe that the problem now is really dealing with the empty containers and how to move them out. There is a large number of empty containers. Um, estimates vary from 80 to about a, a little over 100,000 uh, empty containers that are in the, in the country today. There is, there obviously was a good reason why some of these containers got held back in the country, one of which was in the interest of expediency. Both shipping lines and port operators needed to priorita prioritize laden containers, both imports and exports. Also, there was a scheduling challenge when the waiting time of the boats was significantly longer, and so the boats needed to make a decision that instead of loading empties, they they uh, shorten their their birthing time in order to make it to the next port. As I said, all of these are um, are acceptable reasons. There were exigencies of the times at the time at, at the time this was occurring. However, the reality today is we are going to be able to handle both empties handling of empties uh, significantly more efficient. The bottleneck right now uh, is going to be in the return of the empty containers from the importers going back to the shipping lines through container yards. The truckers have constantly been complaining that container yards are not able to absorb the empty containers. Clearly the truckers need to unload these empty containers otherwise they cannot move back to the port and take on a laden load. Uh, there have been requests for 24-hour uh, uh, processing at, at, M at container depots. Uh, we have received issues and complaints from importers regarding uh, charges levied upon them for not returning the containers on time. 
the 72-hour container return. However, uh, we have allowed the private sector to try to resolve certain things among themselves. From the very start, Your Honor, the Cabinet was very cautious in intervening into contractual arrangements between private parties. A number of us in the cluster believe that private sector should be given an opportunity to resolve the issues among themselves because, uh, you know, it becomes a, slippy slo a slippery slope when government tries to intervene and push things around. But time and again, we've always said, if and when needed, government will intervene. Uh, on a personal note, I believe that if private sector can come t together and make their own agreements and resolve issues among themselves, that would be the most ideal. But upon instructions of the President, we are doing all the legal studies and preparatory work for intervention when it is necessary. In addition to the challenge of uh, moving empties into the container yards, the other challenge is how do we move out the containers that are already in the country back to where they are most needed. Ideally, a shipping line would always want their empty containers back to where they need it. Um, I'll ask both port operators to update you. They've had a series of meetings the past two or three days on a plan on how to try to move out as much of these empty containers as fast as we can. In consideration thereof, the Cabinet Cluster also took action on the franchising of buses. I mean trucks rather, not buses. So we requested LTFRB to make an accommodation, which uh, LTFRB have already announced a new extended deadline. Uh, there are questions as to the legality of the franchise or not. I believe we can let the appropriate entities uh, take on that, that decision. Uh, the immediate challenge to the cabinet cluster on that is that there is a need to upgrade transport facilities in the country. So this whole franchising thing becomes controversial because of the uh, lifespan of trucks that should be allowed to run on our streets, which affect safety, which, which affect traffic movement. Um, that there, is a, there is a transport plan on how to modernize and improve the facilities. And this is really the basis for such action. Uh, in closing, Your Honor, I believe that the final challenge really is that as we have improved on the throughput and on the flow of goods, now attention should be given to the cost uh, admittedly, there were expenses, additional expenses incurred. Uh, we do not want to put up another regulatory entity as much as possible. Uh, the, industry moved, the shipping industry moved on as best as it could through the years without any major hitches. Uh, we are hoping that there will be no need for government to make a direct intervention again, again, and as much as we do not believe that uh, government intervention uh, should be the first call as it should be a final uh, it should be a final option we are hoping that the parties to contracts the realities of having incurred costs and expenses be rationalized among the players within the industry among the importers the shipping companies the container yard operators the truckers uh, admittedly there are costs going around uh, and will continue to go around Ideally, the importers are saying, "Why should? when do we get to see rates go back to where they were? Uh, and they probably should go back to where they were once we normalize the situation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to open your honor. I'll, I'd be glad to answer questions and join in the discussions later, but I believe the, the port operators and the PPA can give us a better update of the status. Thank you. Um, Secretary Mendras, just quickly, the LTFRB um, there was an October 16, if I'm not mistaken, originally deadline to provide uh, provisional authority you know, for the trucks without franchises. Now, that has been moved to what date? Uh, it's now January 31, I understand, okay. uh, of 2015. Okay. So, trucks that go to the port okay, will be given a provisional authority, even without finalizing their franchises. So they can continue to operate until January 31. Yes. There is a, there's, two, there's quite a number of reasons for that. We want to make sure that nothing happens. We expect the volume of cargo to increase. Has, we've already seen the increase. Uh, it's happening now. But we're just getting ready for more to come. Uh, we're getting reports that the backlog in the offshore areas are already addressed. But we still have the year-end volume to worry about. 
traditionally, the volume of cargo starts coming down uh, January, Sean. So that's why we're moving everything to post-January. The other reason for that also is we're also going to take action on the 150-day free, 150-day uh, non-tax um, given to shipping lines for their containers, meaning so long as they move it out of the country, within that period, they, they need not worry about taxes or their containers being confiscated. We are going to take action on that after January 31. Uh, Your Honor, it's very important to, I know there have been so many criticisms about raising uh, storage fees in the ports, reducing storage time. Um, Your Honor, we, we need to bring the port of Manila to the international realities, okay? Uh, our, the charges of the port of Manila are below some of, are below the charges of the other, what the other ports are doing. So we, we are actually trying to calibrate that. And we are now, we have a better understanding of why the dynamics of these uh, play a critical role to the efficiency of a port. I mean, if you leave your container in Hong Kong port, it's, the port operator does not want you to leave your container in the Hong Kong port. I believe the reality is that's why we're saying, okay, we're going to give you time. Uh, people need to put up their own warehouses. People need to improve their logistics management operations. But we cannot let uh, private companies take advantage of the port as a storage facility because the economy is growing and we are going to see a lot more cargo coming in. So we need the space there. Now, there have been criticisms about the fact that there was no planning for the port uh, in my own view there's been there's been significant planning on the port uh, some chambers of commerce said that there was no foresight and there's no in reality there was it's just that there were restraining orders and there were actions of past administrations that really just put us aside I mean we reclaimed the area in the port to be used as a port and then we eventually gave it up for another purpose I mean uh, I think it is not a fair accusation to say there is no foresight. There was actually a lot of foresight, but the realities of uh, political considerations at that time uh, played a role in that. Now, this administration is trying to clean up on that by trying to put it right. But, of course, we have to abide by certain legal constraints also. Uh, that's why later when we start talking about the future, the midterm and the long-term options, the, it would be good to discuss this, Your Honors. Thank you. We'll, we'll move to the, um, P would PPA want to start or uh, would they yield to the port operators? No? So, um, uh, Christian, could you give us a quick update and uh, where's Sean? Ah, there, Sean. <laughs> also give us a quick update. No? Then maybe, uh, Richard, you can also give a, although um, the Manila North Harbor port is currently just servicing domestic uh, domestic um, clients, no? but maybe you could also give us a quick update regarding your operations as well. So we'll start with Christian. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, well, there's good news and bad news, as, as, he, as the um, uh, Secretary said. Um, the good news from uh, MICT's perspective is uh, last week we actually did a record amount of volume for a week. So the throughput going through the terminals is, is extremely good. Um, both through the gate and off the key. Um, we received the highest number of empty containers for the year so far, so the empties are now starting to come into the container terminals. Um, the problem on our side at the moment is we're going into the peak season now with a backlog that's also out in foreign ports and that surge is coming in. In the past, we've started the peak season with no ships waiting and, 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 um, and significant uh, capacity in the yard which, of course, because of the truck ban was not the case this time. But um, we see improvements, uh, particularly in relation to um, waiting time of ships, which has come down by half since the... Uh, um, there's still a lot of them, but the waiting time has come down by half since September 15 when the truck ban was, was ended. And actually, a lot of the ships waiting out there were due to to circumstances related to weather, not Typhoon Henry, the first case which drove the number up, and the typhoons that have been hitting Japan, which have severely affected the schedules of vessels doing the North Asia routes. Um, if I can speak very quickly before I turn over to Sean, the, the, 
the great news that I heard yesterday was that there were no longer any ships waiting at South Harbor. So this is a very, very big achievement, at least on their part, given the fact that we've only been one month since the truck ban was ended. So with, with that, uh, um, oh, w just, just another quick update before I turn over to Sean. Um, we understand that there are very, very serious issues with the shipping lines in relation to empties. The update that I received this morning was that there are 56,100 um, empties in the community, um, some of which, when I say community, outside the container terminals. Um, some at the depots and a significant number with consignees, which is where the difficulty is coming. Um, we have, working with the cabinet cluster, um, received approval from DOTC and PPA to proceed with our, our massive reclamation. Uh, the development of our reclamation, which has been uh, held back in the past, uh, that will be open uh, by the end of October, effectively doubling the empty capacity of MICT. Um, we will then go line by line, uh, depending on who has the highest inventory, allow them um, at will and without restriction to put empties into that facility and schedule ship outs. And our intention is to do about 20,000 a month. If if the roads and, 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 and trucking can be organized. That's the only restriction we'll put. We want the deliveries of the empties into the terminal to be spread over seven days so that we don't have a, a, a bad effect on, on the traffic flow outside the ports. Um, so with, with that, Senator, if you don't mind, I'll turn over to Sean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's been practically positive news for South Harbor since the time that truck ban was lifted. If I may, well, Chris has already preempted me. Today we, we only have one ship that's at anchor and she will be berthing by tonight. And this has come from a high of um, prior to the truck ban. And the other part of it is that when we were at capacity prior to truck ban, our yard utilization now is at 86. So you see that the trend is really going down. And I would say it's because the deliveries per day has improved. From our, our area, it's gone up by about 45% daily deliveries from when it was prior to the truck ban. And speaking about empties, Secretary Almendra said that one of the main issues is empties. Correct. And over the past three weeks, we have actually seen 36% increase in our empty loadout of empties, which, is, which means that the shipping lines want to remove the cargo, evacuate it, but getting it there has been a constraint before. So now that they're able to move around freely, the free flow of trucks has allowed the empties to be returned and for the, um, the, the uh, laden boxes to be withdrawn from the terminal. These are the reasons why we have come to a very positive level where we are right now. Thank you. Um, Richard, just quickly, please. Uh, uh, just uh, to uh, summarize, with, as you uh, mentioned, Your Honor, the, uh, we are a, a d domestic uh, volume. What we have been asked to do in the last uh, uh, several weeks is, because of the uh, uh, empty situation, uh, some of the major importers, uh, one in particular, uh, could not get access to its imports unless they could assure an empty storage area for the empty containers when they've been unpacked. So, we're hand, so they asked us if we could uh, store their empty containers for the time being, uh, which we're doing. Of course, we don't. Uh, it's not a business we'd like to do because uh, the port is a transit area to move the goods in and out quickly. But in the interests of um, this major importer, uh, we, uh, we have accommodated them. Some of the other lines as well have asked us to empty which they can position into uh, Davao and Cebu as well so they can go out on their regional feeders as well. So we've been assisting there too. Uh, our um, uh, utilization, birth utilization is around about say uh, uh, 45 to 50 percent, peaking at 64 uh, percent and our yard utilization is about 55 percent, peaking at about the same time about 60 to 62 okay. percent. Uh, Kapsek, you're raising your hand. Sir, Mr. Chair, sorry, that was a very important statement. Mm -hmm. A major importer was required by the shipping line 
to find its own storage for empties. Can we clarify that? Yes, that's true. May we know which importer this is and under what circumstances which shipping line uh, passed on the problem of finding a, an empty container yard? I mean, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the obligation of the importer is to return the container to the shipping line. So I don't know, that's why I wanted to understand the dynamics of why is the importer being required to find his own container yard storage? Uh, the, show, I think the shipping line had no depot to put its empty containers in. So he passed it on to the importer. Into the importer, and, and they contacted us, and we've got the containers there now. Yeah. Okay, let me ask PPA, um, Raul, whose responsibility is it to, to um, contract a, a, uh, a, a yard for the empties? That's the shipping lines, right? Shipping lines, sir. That's, that's is that the problem of the importer or the shipping line? It should be the shipping line's responsibility. Okay, and um, I, what what I think, Sekrena, you were one step short from saying uh, for for sharing a point here, no? And that point is uh, with regard to the container yards. It should be the shipping lines that contract that, and not the importers or not the port operators either, no? There is a there is a there is a time frame, Your Honor. Sorry, Your Honor. You might, maybe I'll go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. There is a time frame wherein a, an importer is supposed to return a container, right? And because this has been the major complaints of the con of the importers, they end up paying for the fee, the charges, because they're not able to return it to a container yard. Um, our container yards are here. We've met with some of the container yards operators, and there's nothing I can do if I'm full already, right? So this is. I'm sorry. This is an important point because I think. We, this is one of the keys to solving the problem. Uh, sorry, to be honest about it, apparently cost of cost is an issue. Uh, container yard operators are saying they're incurring additional costs. Shipping lines are telling us, no, but we paid you already for, for handling this, but there's a space limitation. I was really just very curious at the statement that an importer was required by a shipping line to find his own uh, yard, otherwise he cannot pull out his 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 goods. That to me is very okay. interesting, Your Honor. Uh, before before Michael, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Fontanilla, uh, what 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 is the ano po yung protocol talaga natin sa sa mga container depots? It's the shipping lines that contract you, right? Not the importers. Oh, that's right, Your Honor. The and contract it, is with the shipping lines. And is it true that there have been cases where uh, you have no more space for the containers? Uh, that, well, right now, with your group, no? yeah, I'm sure you, you're, you're speaking like for your group. For Metro Manila, we still have spaces, but it's outside Metro Manila. That's in Bulacan and and Cavite. For Met for Manila or Metro Manila, we don't have any more space, Your Honor. Okay, but um, for every container that the shipping line uh, brings in, there's a yard that uh, corresponds to that container, right? That's correct. Yeah. So how can there be a situation where uh, the yards are full already, considering that these are contracted out? Previously, because I know the truckers are, that's also some of the complaints of the truckers, that uh, they go to the yards, dun sila naka-assign, tapos sarado or wala nang space, di ba? So how can, that, how can that situation happen if there are contracts yeah. between the parties? Because, for example, Your Honor, one container yard would have uh, three or several shipping lines. So what we do is we do a certain allocation for each of our clients, customers. So um, based on their allocation, they... They bring in the empty containers. If they reach the location, we cannot accept them anymore. And one shipping line would have at least two CY container yards. Yes, but hindi ho ba yan one is to one? Um, like, is it just an open contract na anytime I come in, I'll just send you my containers? Or there's a space allocation, the, a location on the ship the, allocation? The, there is a space allocation, Your Honor. In so fact, how, it's in the contract. So how uh, does it get to a point where you have no more space for them? Well, that's the problem because in the past few months, that's really what happened. They already exceeded their allocation, so and we can no longer accommodate them. Yeah, that, that's my question, sir. No? So how can you exceed allocation? Um, so, so in short, for example, I'm a shipping line. I have 100. You have 90. Our contract is for 90, or our contract will only be for 90 because that's only the space yes. that you have, no? Yeah, that's correct. So it's incumbent upon me to find space for the rest. Yes, yes. Oh, so why would I still send my truckers to you if beforehand 
I knew that the space was only for Be because for because your honor sometimes the inventory goes up and down so mm -hmm. they usually contact us for uh, it's a it's a moving uh, uh, inventory so for example today they uh, taken out ten so we we'll tell them okay you can bring in ten mm -hmm. but sometimes they have several people so they try to you know they don't know where to. Uh, send, for example, they have 100 containers and they want to send it to several of these depots, and they have to look. At, they have to ask each and every dep depot how much is available for their allocation. So, so I think that's the difficulty. Oh, so in the Russia one is the one correspondent. It's not. It's an open contract. That's correct. And there are times that I guess during the truck ban, na gulo yung yeah, yung proseso, and then the the the, the flow of uh, your transactions na gulo. That's precisely right. That, that's probably it. No. Yes. Okay. Have we corrected that already? Considering that the ports are now, um, could I say, Sean, and more normal, no, more normal operations. Would you want to add something? Um, the the biggest complaint originally of the truck ban was the fact that when uh, the mayor and vice mayor opened up the window during the day, they only opened it up for laden containers. They did not allow empties, and in that three or four week period, the the depots had absolutely no way to send containers out to the mm. to the container terminals. In the meantime, the imports were piling up, coming off the ships, because then the imports could not go out because there weren't enough trucks because the truck ban was limiting the flow of the trucks. Okay. But so um, now, sir, with the with the opening up and and opening up of space, uh, particularly with the new development and uh, at at MICT and and the reduction of of utilization in South Harbor. Little by little, we'll pick that up, but it's not going to happen overnight. Okay. There's going to be a lot of pain still. Okay. Now, um, I haven't forgotten you, Michael. I'll get back to you. But with with any type of pain, for example, there are ways to, to mitigate the pain. Um, one problem here is that uh, if the containers have nowhere to go, the trucks basically will be utilized longer. That's why they'll have to charge more. No, uh, the container yards also don't want to open uh, at graveyard shift. No, if I'm not mistaken, uh, have you been opening at graveyard shift already? Uh, yes, your honor. We starting this month. We are already okay. in 24 hour. Okay. So uh, in that case, but you've been saying that, uh, or at least maybe not your group, no, but some container yard operators have been saying, who's going to pay for these extra operations? No. So in effect, you'll have to charge more. The truckers will also have to charge more. Everyone charges more. In the end, it's the consumer who will who will suffer for that. No, that's what we want to. That's what we don't want to happen. No. So in this case, uh, we went to the ports the other week. We saw that uh, in terms of the operations, in terms of the space, things are much much better now. No, and and the reports have shown that things are getting better. But it's not just that because it's a chain of all of these events and processes that we have to look at. So if the ports, at least in that sense, no, the physical congestion of our ports are, are more or less um, improving, are improving already, we look at the other processes. No? And later we'll also go to the legal processes. No? But uh, with regard to this physical process of bringing the containers, you're already in, uh, in partnership or already working with Task Force Pantalan no? to solve this issue, no? Mr. Fontanilla? Yes, Your Honor. So, at what point will we go back to the to the pre truck ban operations? No, that uh, when they send a container to you, you, you won't turn them away, and hence the trucks won't have extra, uh, won't uh, be charging for extra time. For example, uh, when will we get to that point? Uh, honestly, it, can we do it within a month or before November or uh, before December? Honestly, Your Honor, like for example, the Metro Ma in Manila, see why we're still not seeing any uh, reduction in the mm. in the inventory. Why not? Uh, may I do the math. Um, our, we believe that the capacity in in Manila is twenty two thousand TU. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Twenty four. Twenty about twenty five. Yeah, twenty five. Mm -hmm. um, so the and then actually what they have is actually 30 plus no so you include bulacan and cavite and all of that so the key is for us to get that entire backlog which is actually coming down as i see from the the daily reports from the line and then get their inventory below the 24. yeah the minute we open that birth seven backup area 
the significant bulk of that will be eliminated. And and when when will Bird Seven be open? October thirty first. Okay, so within a month's time. Or, so, or earlier. And who will spend for bringing those empties to Bird Seven? The lines. The lines will spend lines. for that. Um, Pedro is here, no? So maybe it's time to ask uh, Attorney Aguilar to give his two cents. We've been talking about the lines a lot here. Would you want to add anything, or do you agree with everything's being said? Well, insofar as the import and export cargoes, yes. But uh, we're concerned more on the domestic side of shipping. And uh, so far, uh, I, I would uh, concur with uh, Richard. Uh, the, the, the problem is not so much in the domestic. Uh, but even with the lifting, so long as there is a congestion on the roads leading to and from the ports, then the North Harbor is connected with the South. So we still... Uh, we'll get there, Attorney Aguilar, no, later on, no, sa medium and long-term solutions. But with regard to what's been said about the, the shipping lines, the container depots, although I know you're more familiar with the domestic shipping, no, but I'm sure you're also familiar with the international side, no? Would you concur with everything that's being said here? Yes, uh, everything that has been said by the resource speaker, by Christian, mm -hmm. by Sean, and Charles uh, and Richard are are correct. Yes. No? yes. So, in, in terms of the shipping lines, they have been um, charging. Um, they've been charging the truckers if late to dumating yung containers nila. Tama ba yun? That's the that's the uh, logical outcome of business. Uh -huh. when, it, when you incur more time, the turnaround is affected. Then somehow you should, uh, the, the, the owner would, would pass it on to the ultimate uh, user of the... Uh, which the is the consumer, yes, no? yes. which is what we don't want to happen. Right. Yeah. Yes, but in this right. case, uh, the solution being proposed here is that by October 31, Bird 7 will open up. That will have space for the empties and our container depots will go back to normal operations where if a shipping company assigns a container, they will have space in the in the depots. Um, S Senator, just a clarification. Yes. No? Um, it will open up more capacity, but w we, we can't just fill up Bird 7 and... and so you're one and, solution. No, and then go back to the... Uh, that needs to be a constant flow, in, out, in, out, in, out. Okay. Uh, Secretary. Yes. Your Honor, the, the, the mid-term solution, and we have made this appeal, and I, gr I am grateful to the container yard operators such as Mr. Fontanilla's group and the others who have been cooperating, is to come up with a container tracking system once it leaves the port. Because right now, Your Honor, both port operators have a container tracking system as the container comes into the port unloaded. Where it is, is it moving? The Bureau of Customs is coming into the picture with its own automated system which will allow us to track that and actually solve a lot of our problems. But the minute the the container is loaded to a truck we that data is available at the port on which truck pull it out but when it gets out of the port there is no tracking system so we have made an appeal and i'm grateful that the truckers have also stepped up and said they are going to come up with an, uh, you know some something as simple as a cell phone app just to make sure that there is a container da tracking database so that the shipping lines the container yard operators and the truckers don't need to argue. I mean, real-time basis, if a container yard has 10 extra shipping lines, knows exactly, I can load 10 more containers there, tells the trucker, put this here. And, or if the container yard only has two more slots left for the shipping line, it can be passed on. This is the way we will prevent a future incident to this effect. This is in answer to the question of when can we solve this problem. I think we can solve this problem when we're able to to do that tracking so that we can complete the loop. Once the container, empty container enters the yard, when it's scanned, then we can track it again all the way until we're able to ship it out, Your Honor. Well, I think if there's one positive thing that's coming from this problem is that uh, we're putting in solutions, hopefully, will be f which will be for the long term. I mean, I'd just like to commend uh, uh, ATI's presentation on that uh, stoplight thing now with the uh, with the trucks no i hope um, we'll all be using that no? so in, in effect that that um, that system which basically tells you there's space or there's no space you should go or you shouldn't go will complete the loop all the way from the trucks picking up uh, goods or sending goods to the port all the way to 
they bring it to the containers, no? And probably, SEC, who is the agency on top of that? Or is it a private sector initiative? Well, the private sector has volunteered to step up, but we are, we, we are willing to step in if we need to. Because the dream, the dream, Your Honor, is to have a all the way to truck dispatching. So there will be no more trucks stuck on a Bonifacio waiting. Yeah. Every truck driver knows, I will go to the port from 9 o'clock in the morning to 9.15. When he enters the port, the port operator is ready with a container to be loaded to you in 15, sorry, Chris, Sean, and everyone put you on the line here. How fast? <laughs> Hong Kong's what, 15 minutes? With the appointment system, yes. Yeah, so Without it, it was three, four hours. See, so instead of the truck being stuck waiting for three to four hours in the port, called creating traffic, you have a 15-minute window. You know that when your truck goes in, in 15 minutes, it should come out. In other words... The port operators are ready, the, the container has been cleared, and so on. So and all the way to the container yard, no? And even the, the container back. yard, they would know if there's space or not. So, so need that's a yung trip nila, no? So the truck dispatch system will allow double double commit transaction, which is the truck that's going to bring in the empty container it can also be already pre-scheduled a week before that he's also going to pick up this container in time. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we're, the, the problem is we, the Port of Manila is in such a location that we're, you know, we're building infrastructure to it. But even when we build the infrastructure, rate, at the rate the economy is growing, we still need to put all of these efficiency-enhancing systems mm -hmm. that will both solve um, tracking as well as corruption. Okay, we will solve corruption by using systems and transparency met methodology, so that people will know where and whether it's, whether a container is supposed to or not supposed to move. Okay. We're, we're going to go to the corruption issue, um, Secretary, no? but we'll, we'll have Michael quickly and then Sean. Just quickly, please. Okay. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Um, if you will allow, we will uh, make a statement later on uh, with respect to the root causes of the, of the problems and uh, a few suggested solutions. But I would like to re uh, uh, directly respond to some of the questions which came up in the course of the discussion so far. Um, I'm wearing two hats. Huh? I'm the president of the ECCP on, on one side, but I'm also an industry player. I have some insights from the shop floor. Uh, we are one of the major uh, logistics companies uh, uh, serving uh, San Miguel and San Miguel is the company which had the issue with respect to the uh, return of the empty containers. They made arrangements with Harbor Center to uh, to deliver the empty containers. So that is straight uh, a straight uh, answer to that question. But that leads to the question as to the role of the shipping lines. And again, despite the fact I have many good friends in the shipping line industry, I do believe that the shipping lines have to uh, step up to their own responsibilities here. And I think it was uh, already uh, initially addressed that the, the liability and responsibility of the shipping line is upon they have to make provisions for the efficient acceptance of the return of empty containers. If they do not, I do. Uh, uh, it is my considered opinion that it is not the responsibility of the importers to uh, answer for the consequential cost. Uh, uh, neither is it the responsibility of the of the port, but indeed the shipping lines. Um, further corollary uh, uh, measures to reduce the gestation time of the empty containers here in the country to resolve the uh, the, the present uh, congestion uh, could also could also help. But I think it is very very important to make that point and to make that point publicly that the shipping lines are responsible for the return of the empties, and if they don't, any costs have to be answered by them. Once that is clear, I can see that more efforts are being made also by the shipping lines to uh, to step in and uh, do the necessary. And just a, a few seconds on the root cause of the empties, the problems with the empties, because in reality uh, this is a, in a way a positive problem because economy of the Philippines is increasing. Uh, Philippines has been very successful in the development of BPO industry. The remittances of uh, foreign workers are increasing. That means the patterns of trade in the Philippines is changing to the effect that you have more consumer goods uh, in, in, in relation to export uh, uh, cargo. So you have an imbalance, and that imbalance is growing and needs to be addressed also going, uh, going, going forward, and it's a part of the problem. Thank you. Sec uh, let me ask the question also. 
before you ask a question or respond, um, with regard to the shipping lines, are we already convening the shipping lines and talking to them regarding the the costs and their responsibilities and accountabilities? We are, right? Uh, Your Honor, yes, DTI has been and is going to call more meetings. Um, we are talking, we are uh, asking for cooperation. Uh, we are admittedly studying uh, more definitive and aggressive action on part of government, but it is the hope that it doesn't need to go to that level. Your Honor, may I just put on record that there are shipping lines that are very good. They are very efficient. There's one particular shipping line whose empties is so well managed. Okay, uh, there's, there's very few empties left in the Philippines, despite the fact that there was a congestion. So, uh, they have the correct systems, they have the correct practices to make it happen. I'm not saying all shipping lines are a problem. I just wanted to put on record that there are a majority probably of shipping lines are actually doing very well. But Your Honor, I'm just so very curious and please forgive me. Who is the shipping line that told San Miguel that they cannot pull out their imports if they cannot put their empties in a storage capacity? I need that on record, Your Honor. Probably Mr. Parkley will know. I don't, uh, I don't know. Well, I, uh, I do know, but I don't know if the shipping line is just a, uh, the only one, of course. By the way, it's, uh, it wasn't Harbour Centre, it was Manila North Harbour who contracted with San Miguel to bring the empties in. But the company was uh, SITC. The shipping line is? SITC. Okay. Okay. On record, Your Honor. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we go to Manu Orinino, you know, just a second. Um, is it just Manu or news left? Okay. How are you going to talk about, um, what would you want to talk, the empties? Because right. I want to ask you other questions also later. Do you want to talk about the empties first? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. But, uh, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, last time we met, Senator Escudero said, short and long term, we didn't have that. And you said, add the private sector, come in. I'd like to let you know that Secretary Almendras has encouraged us, and I speak now with many hats. Actually, my main role right now is that I am coordinator of importers, exporters, shipping lines, port operators, truckers, etc. So what I'll tell you is not my opinion, nor Alianza Agriculture, which is my personal, my personal uh, main priority, but the private sector. Having said that, Mr. Chair, and this is in fact the key problem, but just to re retrospect, on September 30, October 10, October 16, I personally handed to you the short-term ones, and today I'm handing you the long-term ones, submitted by the port operators, uh, shipping lines, etc., which you're reviewing. Now, let's go to the bottom line. There were three problems, as you recall. Truck ban, we've kind of solved that, not perfect yet. Truck availability, deep problem, had they not made a decision, we would have one-third of all trucks off the road. They also solved that. The remaining one's congestion. And the bottom line there is the empties. Of course, as Secretary Domingo said, the imports are much worse than exports, but there's still the problem with empties that can solve it. Now, what is the solution there? And I'll yield my uh, floor to LC for the statistics. First of all, the first point in my letter to you today is, in fact, what everybody's talking about. What is the role of shipping lines? And I'd like to report to you that, in fact, we met shipping lines only and only shipping lines on October 3 and October 10. And happily, Secretary Almeras has a very beautiful technique. He gets their names, he can invite them to dinner, can suggest Kim and RSS dinner with them, and all of a sudden, Mr. Chair, we've been doing this, but when Secretary Madras got involved, the ship lines all of a sudden have whole day meeting, correct? And they had beautiful results. Not beautiful enough, but beautiful enough. Therefore, while we do not want government intervention, we like the kind of fantastic influence that Secretary Madras is doing. Because I will tell you, when he says that, people move and they've moved. Now, what are, what are their achievements so far? First of all, the fact that they're responsible is not clear. As a matter of fact, if you look at the incentive situation, I myself don't like punishment, I like incentives. But they are incented not to do anything because any delay in empties does not yield to their bottom line. They stick the traffic partners for that. That's very wrong, very wrong, okay? If you just change that, that will help. But the rule must be motivated by the Secretary Almendra's influence plus the financial system, all right, which we've agreed on, which we can do later. And the second one is this. And this is the last one, then I'll give to uh, Ms. Chua. 24-7, when I asked them, we gave you this, 
and you talk to Sir Almendras, you heard him talk about this. What is the result of your whole day meeting? And they said, and I quote, actually we cannot do it because we open it. Uh, they can open it, but if you want us to pay for it, we're not going to pay for it because this one is one where we invest and there's not enough volume and we don't want to spend. When I mentioned this, the truck leaders here complained and they said that is absolutely not true. And while there are good and better, the good, okay, really refuse them, get the guy to get in, it's a mess. But the Secretary of Menas now getting specifics, that will be done. What am I saying therefore? The key problem in the next three months is empties and the solution is the shipping lines if they take responsibility because already the shipping yards have a resolution which we also contributed to saying they're going to open 24 7 but they're not going to pay shipping lines have said we're not paying you see but with Central Mendras but as I said there are many good ones the bad ones the good ones don't we have that Central Mendras with with dinner I think it'll shape up so I'd like to say the following number one since you said private sector Central Mendras has done this we talked to him 30 times a week they're extremely supportive number two We've shown our metal that 13 minutes uh, time to have a truck go is down to 45 seconds because private sector is involved and they're very open. And three and last point, that ever since Carl Mendras got this involved and with this communication, we like to make a bottom line. If there's only one thing we'll say today, only one, we have many, only one. Of course, we like to mention that the, the, the import accreditation is down from two months to two days in BOC, but still two months in, in uh, B. B, B I R simply because they have 20 people for 15,000 applications. Repeat, 20 people, 15,000 applications. But the main one is the MTs. And the solution to the MTs is simply what you've mentioned. The moment the shipping lines take responsibility for the MTs, but the incentive financial should be correct, instead of sticking to them, it should go back to them. This will be solved. So we, we think that We've gotten great improvement, but Mr. Chair, I would deceive you if you believe congestion is over. Not at all. We believe this is going to be a big challenge with the uh, December coming in, and I'd like to yield the floor to Ms. Elsie Chua. Wait, one second, uh, Elsie. No. So just to clarify, when we're saying that the shipping line should take responsibility, what exactly do you mean? Should they defer the charges for the late... Um, the, the the late return of the containers, should they take on that cost? What what exactly do you mean there, Ernie? I mean two things. First of all, it's a fiction, it's a fiction, I repeat, when they put the, shop, the depot that is supposed to go to, they put it there, it's a fiction because it's not true. Those things are often, uh, you know, filled up, and the poor trucker has to look for his own. Responsive means that they must know where it is, so we have a suggestion that, in fact, they call, and if they are responsible for a delay, they must pay. Right now, they don't pay a cent. We believe the truckers importers should pay if it's their problem because, you see, let me tell you a secret. Some truckers, okay, not everyone's a saint. What they do is they have a better, they have a better uh, business coming along. They put it aside. They do that. And, of course, that's their fault. But this will be solved by system. Mr. Chair, I'd like to say this. Systems is the solution. And Mr. Almeras is a systems man. We're on our way to doing it well. So the first one, of course, is the system. The the charging. It is ridiculous that the poor important trucker pays for something that shipping line should take care of. And once you reverse that, then I was told when shipping lines they're going to pay, they're going to look for shipping lines, they're going to make it very efficient. Okay. Secretary, the, the ability of the shipping lines to charge for late containers, no, that's, that's not regulated. No? Government can't regulate that. That's a contract already. So we're looking for cooperation. No? There's no... PPA can't do anything about that. DPI can't do anything about that. We need to be able to work with the private sector for the for the clubs to actually do this reform. Tama po yun? Your Honor, ideally they should be able, private sector should be able to resolve it. Ideally, because I believe it is slippery slope when government starts getting involved exactly. in pricing structures. But so far, the the shipping companies that we've spoken to, I, I don't know if you Secretary Magiba wants to respond to this. DPI has been convening the the shipping companies, no? Have they been responsive to these uh, concerns? Something, sometime in October, Mr. Chairman, shipping lines uh, brought in what they call sweepers, no? I think for two weeks to three weeks, they've been doing that, dedicated only to take out empty containers. No, you say, the, the, the two concerns of um, Mr. Ordonez, one is the uh, openness to making sure that uh, their containers actually go to a designated yard with allocated space. 
and two is deferring the charges um, that they've been charging the truckers actually in which the truckers are charging the importers in which the importers will eventually charge the consumers no so have they been amenable at least for this period that we're congested have they been amenable to 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 lengthening the number of days or or deferring those charges while this uh, congestion issue is at hand? I think two weeks ago they met as a group, and I think some members are willing to waive some detention charges. But as Secretary Almendra said, that uh, it's actually a private and commercial decision. Yeah. Now, who among those shipping lines had agreed to waive detention yeah. charges? We really don't know. Yeah, no, but we'd like to see a list of that as well, uh, Yusek de Magiba, if you can provide the committee also a list. So at least we would know who are cooperating in this time of national interest. No? Yes. Mr. 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 Chairman, Mr. I must speak the truth, okay? And the truth is that they officially stated they're not going to pay for the opening of those shipping yards at night because it's bad for their ROI. But that is not all. Those are the non-best people. Now... We plead government must get involved, not through regulation, though I was undersecretary when we had shipper council when we did have regulation and this never came through, but with involvement the way Secretary Almeida is doing it. Now, let me tell you the, the truth. When that happened, I requested the cabinet cluster now to get involved because when the shipping lines meet the private sector, they do what they want. But when Secretary Almeida appears, Secretary Almeida appears, you know, they showed up. Today is very important. Because today you, the chair, are saying that we agree shipping rights might not take responsibility. That is very strong. If in addition you have a follow-up meeting and we get names of people and we get the reversal of charge, which is common sense, it is common sense that if it's their fault, they should pay for it. Things will move. Because if I'm a shipping line, I'm a businessman in reality. If I do not get hurt, I don't care what happens to those empties. But if I get hurt because I've not given them right information and I have to pay the extra charge which I should, then I'll wake up. Okay, let me ask um, Attorney Aguilar here. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, no? But uh, your your association includes both domestic and international, if I'm not mistaken, right? Only, only domestic. Uh, only domestic, yeah. no? But yes. Okay, so I won't put you on the spot that much, but just a little bit, Attorney, no? Would you care to comment on the discussion currently taking place regarding the responsibility of the shipping companies? No? Do you agree? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a, I have clients who are. Uh, in, in the logistics business, and it's it's really it's really uh, standard that the, the the okay the owner of the containers are the shipping lines, and in fact once uh, once uh, an, uh, a container comes in, the importer puts up uh, deposit a deposit to guarantee that the expo the importer would return. The container, and in fact, if if the importer doesn't uh, return the 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 container within the time frame, uh, shipping lines would charge them runs. And uh, the problem is if if the importer returns the container, and there's no no space for the container in the uh, container yard, then that that's the problem. So I, I don't see any logic or in a legal, legal basis for the shipping lines to charge the, the importer. But they are. <laughs> yeah. But they are. That's the problem. No, they are. Um, uh, they are. Ms. Zapata, do you want to yes. you raise your hand? No, very quickly, Lam, please. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is being said that the problem of the empty return is because there is a container imbalance. There is a port congestion. I just would like to simply state that those conditions have been charged to us being an importer we are paying uh, the shipping line of port congestion surcharge container imbalance surcharge terminal handling charge emergency recovery because of this problem and the provision of the space for the return of empty is their extended service to us and I think uh, if the shipping line will just do the responsibility with their own equipment we will not have that this problem as we are right now. And we are happy by now that more or less everybody in here now is aware that the problem now is the empty container. And some other things that we have said in the past that, well, if the empty containers address, I think we can easily get in and out of the port already. 
And if you want to get a solution, your short-term solution that you are talking, we have that suggestion that been constantly in saying that, that 10 years ago, it is tried and tested solution that all shipping lines operate their own empty container outside of the port. And once we are going inside the port, we are barehanded and we will just go directly to the location of our laden container to pick up. And it will shorten our process instead of going to the place, location of where our empty will be unloaded. So I think... Uh, 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 we are happy that uh, the task force Mantalang is now open and aware that the, re the biggest problem right now is the return of MT. And it is being passed on to the importer. It's true. Be by the shipping line because if we, sh if we importer will not do some way of having that empty container kept on our depot, we cannot have the second turn of a lot of our trips. So our productivity is really okay. lessened. Thank you, uh, Ms. Manny. Albert? Uh, regarding the shipping lines responsibility as far as the containers are concerned, first of all, uh, it's a commercial decision on the part of the shipping lines whether uh, they will lengthen or shorten uh, the number of days. You know? Depends on, actually, it depends on the client. If it's a big-time client, meaning uh, they bring in a hundred containers uh, a month, then it's a different story altogether. No? Uh, but basically, those charges are, of course, sa anian sa, sa shipping line op uh, operator yan, like for example, uh, transfer of uh, empty containers from the container yard to the port for loading, you know, for for, if, for shipping out. That's for the account of the shipping lines. Uh, other charges, like for example, in the container yard, leave on, leave off, uh, and the storage uh, inside the container yard, that's for the shipping lines. Now, I think there are some questions, like for example, in the case of overtime, meaning the tracker will bring in the container in the wee hours of the morning or midnight, where most of the time the container yards are closed. You know? So. If the tracker is in a hurry to offload the container, the empty container, then what happens is that uh, the tracker talks to the operator to open up. And of course, the operator will charge the tracker. And uh, the tracker cannot charge that to whoever, the shipping lines or the owner of the cargo. Uh, well, they, they, they can no longer charge that to the importer because may contrata na eh, may contrata na, no? Uh, in the future, he, he might not just right. do that. So let me let me make this. Let me try to clarify this. Uh, uh, who increased their charges during this whole port congestion issue? No, uh, the truckers eventually you increased your charges because there were other charges being increased upon you, and these were the yes, container yard uh, charges. Marami yan, sir. Iba iba. Iba iba. Okay, anong porsyento ng extra charges na yon yung because of the shipping line policies? Would that be the majority of the extra charges? No, hindi naman. Uh, depends yan. Because primarily, the reason why the reason why the trackers increase their charges, it's because of the delay. Okay. Uh, meaning, uh, the, the turnaround time uh, was affected because if the tracker cannot return immediately the container to a container yard or to the port and the container stays on his truck, that means he cannot go back to the port and uh, do another move. Okay. So the truckers, um, nung tumas yung presyo, the importers, of you course, the importers, the importers no? of course, eventually the importers will raise yes. the cost of goods. No? But yes. in, in your case, um, or in the trucker's case, uh, Bert, no? If you look at all of the reasons kung bakit tumaas yung charges ninyo, uh, the congestion, so ngayon yung throughput tumataas na, it's yes, already yes. improving. So your turnaround time should be improving already. Data. Is it? It's not. Uh, because again, it's still the problem of the empty containers. Okay. Remember, like for example right now, mm. while there are new container yards opened up, but it's quite far from the port. No? So, matagal pa rin yung uh, no? like For example, uh, there, there are new container yards opened at Balagtas in Bulacan, and there are also container yards that opened in Malbar. The nearest so far 
it's the one in at the end of Cabitex, you know. Okay. So we're saying that if you're the, the main reason for you increasing your charges is because your turnaround time yes, increased. Turnaround time. The reasons for your turnaround time uh, are the congestion issues, mm -hmm. the problem with the containers, mm -hmm. all of these add up to hindi kayo makapag uh, transact ka agad, hindi nyo makompleto yung loop with a particular within container. The, within, within the time. Oh. Okay. But if, if, uh, if all of the solutions yield the results that we want, you will lower your of prices course. again. No? Of course. Of course. Under normal times, uh, Mr. Senator, if the tracking rate is this, the prevailing rate is this. Oh, what would I have this? Uh, uh, like, uh, like, uh, uh, it's lower than 30%. Okay. So, so competition sets in, you know. Okay. Among, among but class. right now, you have an index of plus what? Plus 100%? Around 50%. 50%, no. Okay. Sige, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to move on to another. Uh, no, okay, may mga tumututo. Sige, Elsie, you first. Uh, can I, I'm Elsie Chua on behalf of representing the Chinese Federation. Um, our, our members mostly are importers and exporters. This is very sad because uh, our really main problem is on the empties. I think uh, the shipping lines are not, the head office are not here. They are represented. That's why I think these are the people are making so much money right now. And I think they don't want to solve the congestion because they're making so much money before. They make more money on uh, charging than the freight. Uh, before the three truck ban, they're charging only $150, but now they're charging uh, container balance for $400, for congestion, $600, and so forth. Who is that, ma'am, again? Sorry. Who is charging that? Shipping lines. Shipping lines. Okay. Uh, let's be clear. So, shipping lines have increased their charges by... From $150 mm -hmm. to $1,000. Wow. Just, just for the congestion fee, without including the other charges. So... Another thing is, I think uh, we should focus, Sunday is a, a little bit low on uh, laden uh, containers, so my suggestion, we use the Sunday to transfer empties from external CYs to port to ship. Let the sweepers get out. And it's the responsibility of whom? Is it the, is it the shipping line? And who will monitor this? And also, let's focus on the empties. There's a suggestion, because the truckers are being charged for detention fees. So the maximum guarantee that uh, turnaround for the trucker to return the empties is seven days. So my question, if the delay of returning the, uh, the container, the empties container by the trucker, who should be charged? Is it uh, the trucker should be charged the shipping line or is it the importer? And then another thing is, I think the best is... Uh, from pulling out the container, we should get the hotline from the shipping line to get the pre-advice or reference number where or when to return. Because if they don't give us this advice, who should be responsible for this and where to return and the number of days. In extra for the number of days, more than seven days not returned, it's not the fault of the importer. Uh, who should pay for those extra charges? The shipping line is charging the importers. In return, it charges the consumer. Another thing, if there's no available CYs, how the tracker to collect? Is it to collect from the importer or is it to collect from the shipping line? Let the AISL handle this, the association of the shipping line. Also, there's another thing that concerns the importers. The staff of the external CYs and the personnel of these shipping lines are the one creating the opportunities or making cotton. If not pre-alert or not pre-advised for reference number, that will not create the cotton. Sorry again, sino po itong, who are you referring to in terms of this cotton issue? Ah, these are the personnel that are working for the CYs and the personnel of the shipping lines. So, in the port. In, is that the same person? The one? Different people. Different people pa yan. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, I have to expose this. So, better to get a pre-alert or uh, pre-advice reference number to avoid making all these corruptions comes in and make these people taking advantage of situation. Now, it has to stop. So, if the tracker should refuse this from the beginning, they're doing this practice for Pakikisama for 100 pesos now, they're charging more than 2,000 pesos per container. Let it be this practice stop. So, 
My suggestion is leadership should come in. Who will be in charge to monitor this extra charges that being done, and who should clear and uh, under what mandate? Thank hey, you. Elsie, now let me get to the. Let me ask some questions now. So there are added charges which are above board, which we, we you're saying is unjustified already. Yes. And there are added charges which are under the table. Yes. Okay. Let's go one by one. For the formal charges, okay, formal charges. Added formal charges from the shipping lines went from $150 to $1,000. Total. Not yet, including other etc. Okay, so from $150 to $1,000. Yes. And we're saying that uh, there's no way that this is, can be justified. None. Okay, and we're already talking to the shipping lines to mitigate these uh, formal charges, uh, yeah. USEC. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, but we reviewed the law here. Uh, we've been hearing about the Shippers Council in 1973 uh, uh, creation, uh, and then uh, abolished sometime in 1992, transferred to Philippine Shippers Bureau, which is a bureau of the DTI. But in all those uh, presidential decrees, Mr. Chairman, there is no specific mandate to really look into rates and charges, meaning it has no power to fix or even to conduct hearing on reasonables. There is a provision on consultation, there is provision of negotiation, there is a provision of encouragement, helping our local shippers, our local exporters get into a reasonable contract with shipping lines, but not the experience we have right now when charges appear to be exorbitant, I want to use appear because they are not here today to, to speak up their mind. No? Uh, unlike unlike LTAPRB, they can look into rates right now. Unlike uh, PPA, they can impose higher storage charges through consultation. Those Shipper Council and Philippine Shippers Bureau, they don't have that mandate. So maybe medium term, long term, in aid of legislation, that can be looked at, Mr. Chairman. That's, uh, yeah, that's the slippery slope that uh, Secretary Mendes is mentioning, no? because we're, when you talk about that, you're regulating a deregulated industry. No? That's it's right. very difficult. Yeah. No? But in terms of meeting with them, getting them to explain the charges, or at least um, you know, there are some charges which probably can be justified. No? But we want this to be of cost. And secondly, once the situation improves, then they should already um, decrease those charges. If your throughput is already improving, there's no reason to, to charge those congestion fees anymore, no? if the throughput has improved already. And if anyway, they charge the truckers, di ba? Kung baga parang doble-doble, it's a double charging yung nangyayari, ano? Yung, uh, Your Honor. Yes, bro. Yung, yung port congestion charge that's being charged by the shipping lines, this is an offshot of mm -hmm. the, the, the ships getting delayed in the offloading of containers in the ports, uh, ships lining up for, for servicing. So they charge port congestion charge. Oh, but for example, Berta, there's only one, one vessel left waiting now. Are they still charging a port congestion charge? Dina. You're, you're not. So what are you doing? No. Uh, we're not the ones charging. No, I know, no, but, um, so, uh, we're not privy to that. Okay. Perhaps it will be... Uh, so let's see, are they still charging? At They're least in the in the sport. charging. Okay, yes, Christian. And in um, fact, increasing. Um, I, uh, Your Honor, I, I highly recommend we we discuss the we put more time into discussing the under the table, uh, because the above board. For, first of all, it, the shipping lines are divided into three categories: mm. wholly owned branches, um, which means the parent company owns the line here. They have different KPIs, different PNL responsibilities. Then you have joint ventures, partly owned by local firm, partly owned by the line themselves. They may have a different way of, of determining what their costs are, how they, how they make their profits. And then you have the agents who make, um, not to accuse the agents, because there are some that are very responsible, but they make commissions on demorage, on uh, certain charges no, that, that they're talking about. Um, because the lines are very fragmented, I think it would be only fair to have them discussing what their cost structures are and the justifications, as opposed to us about it now. talking okay. about it now. Ernie, just a sound bite. Uh, when your auntie became president, I became the youngest mm -hmm. undersecretary, and I was in charge of the government reorganization, and I 
was in charge of DTI. And I am against regulation. But what did they do? Do you think they let prices run around? No. They had suggested retail price, which allows you to go up and down, but there was a price. Here is my complaint. When I was undersecretary, we would call the shipping lines, and we'd have them saying, we don't regulate, but explain. There is no, there is no such thing. And two and a half months ago, I recommended, there's still no such thing. That's why we're very happy that Sacramento told us a few days ago that Ken Secretary would meet them because, as I said, right, it was said to them, there's no meeting. I mean, for example, I'm a businessman. I'll tell you, the quotum is a small percent of what I call the legalized overpricing. It's a small percent. So I admire Mr. Gonzalez, but I think we should do both. And DTI has a mandate. It not only promotes investments, it must pro protect consumer welfare, etc. And it's their job to call them and examine it. Do they know? I'll tell you. They don't know. Do you know why? Because I visit them, I visit their staff. They don't know a thing. It is their job to call them and understand. But they should be brilliant people. They must understand categories, costs, and all that. And they are brilliant people. But they've not been using their brilliance because they've not called the meeting. Correct? Okay. And those meetings, we called the meeting. And we had someone come, but we now want the charm and terrific church no, of Second Domingo and Sacramento Menes. And I think that will be solved because I believe it's ridiculous. I, I was known as the price expert. I was head of pricing for the whole world for the Zeros Corporation. I knew it very well. And I'm telling you, no one is asking them these questions. Okay. That's all. Hey, Yusek uh, Magiba. Maybe this is something that uh, we can look into further. No? Uh, DTI has SRPs on practically everything, whether it's regulated or not. Uh, and I know this because we, we check these SRPs. Uh, can we get the DTI to develop an SRP and can work with the private sector for these charges. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, and you know, you're right, they're not here. So some of these charges might be justified, although it's hard to charge a congestion fee when there's only one left, uh, one ship left that's waiting there. Yeah, so right. can we, excuse me, one second, Bert. So can we uh, look into this uh, under Secretary de Magiba? So at least we can compare. No? The, so far, this has been the, the common voice here has been to really look into the charges of the shipping lines. So can we ask uh, DTI to take the lead, of course, as part of Task Force Pantalan? Okay, could you respond for the record, please? Okay. We will work with the Cabinet Secretary on that. In fact, uh, we have created a technical working group to further continue this matter. Okay. I'm going to move on to another topic, okay? So, you know, since it's already 11.30 and I want to end by, by noon time, uh, what we've seen is that uh, during the height of the port congestion, there was a perfect storm of different uh, activities no? and different reforms that happened. No? On themselves, they were good reforms. No? For example, LTFRB cracking down on Colorum, that's a good reform. But it happened at the same time as the port congestion and that affected the operations. No? Um, BLR, you know, uh, requiring uh, cleaning up the importation no? uh, the, and, and requiring the ICC. I think that's a good reform, no? but again, it happened at the same time as this port congestion. And um, one thing I'd like to look at before we go to the uh, under the table, just look at the legal fees and uh, USEC will look at that, but also the legal processes. No? So I'm happy to hear that LTFRB has, um, has extended again to January, although uh, in the last hearing, I also mentioned, no, I'm not sure if they can do in six months the goal of providing 38,000 uh, franchises to trucks. No? But anyway, I wish them luck with that and I hope they can fulfill that. Now, one of the common complaints is that BOC, uh, our friend from BOC is here, that's uh, attorney, um, sorry, attorney... Corpus, okay, Attorney Corpus, no? You mentioned earlier that you've cut down your turnaround time to, to two days, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, so how were you able to cut down your turnaround time? <laughs> well, uh, processes. Most of it uh, came through uh, automation and uh, we lessened, uh, uh, we increased the transparency. We lessened the uh, face to face transactions. Okay, can you, ano, can you give us a, a quick rundown of the process, no? Ano po ba yung bagong patakaran na. What is the new process that you have instituted, which got all of these importers to to change their their current processes? What was it exactly na, that that you required? Basically, we were still trying to encourage importers to utilize the weekends uh, movement of the cargos. No, no. What I'm referring to is um, what's that? 
Is that the ICC, no? Is that that's the ICC, right? No. So this ICC, which we required, no. When did we start requiring that? We were required that a long time ago, Your Honor. No, it's ICC. Oh, it's uh, actually uh, 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 February of this year. Okay. So what was asked by actually DOF, Your Honor? Yes. So DOF, of course, DOF is the mother agency of both customs and BIR, no. So DOF had this um, new requirement. What was the purpose of this requirement? So that people know, no, ano ba yung purpose ng requirement na ito? And what is the process by which you're able to get this requirement and continue your importation duties? No? Uh, basically, Your Honor, is to streamline the accreditation process and b to make it easier to track down all these erring importers. So what do they have to do? Uh, well, they have to undergo registration, uh, the usual accreditation processes, and uh, with additional requirements from the DOF. Okay. So initially, okay. Um, are you familiar with the process, Attorney Sunshon? We, uh, I'd just like to clarify, Your Honor. The um, the DOF issued Department Order 12-2014 last February 6, okay. 2014. Um, the policy behind this is for the complete tax mapping, um, um, minimize duplication of functions, and ensure maximum productivity of the concerned bureaus with regard to importers and um, brokers who deal with us. Um, it requires uh, the BIR, uh, it requires importers and brokers to uh, get an ICC or a BCC, uh, these are clearance certificates from the BIR, for them to be registered with the BOC. What was the process? They had to go to BOC first? Uh, BIR, Your Honor. First, first BIR. Um, they have to get the clearance certificate and then they have to go to the BOC to be registered with them. Okay, what we've heard is that the BOC has cut down their turnaround time from 30 days to, to 2 days, yes? Uh, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Maybe I know it more than some people. I personally went with LC Chua and the importers and I have 12 criteria for BIR and 10 criteria. And just as we cut the time from 12 minutes to 45 seconds, this is exactly what we did. And secretary uh, and collector came to me, and the secretary policeman told him to talk to me because there's some things that are too much. I mean, I'm the head of anti-smuggling of National Commerce Council. I hate smugglers, but it's an overkill because the majority of the people are taken. You don't need the majority. All you need is the president and treasurer. We did that. Secretary, collector, collector, so said, Ernie, it's beyond my scope. I went to Secretary Prisma, and to their credit, they cut the criteria, right? However, I'm not that finished with the BOC, so it's not so much transparency, it's the actual criteria. Secondly, I have in my hand a document, okay? This document, the recommendations are recommended by the staff, by the staff of BIR with us to cut some unnecessary, extremely difficult thing, right? So I'm saying, sir, that the private sector wants to join the government in building a nation. Do not ignore what we have because some are corrupt and some are smugglers. There's some of us who are still honest. And we give you something done by your own staff that will cut. Right. Uh -huh. So well, the process is you go to BIR, then you go to BOC. Is that right? Yes or, yes or no, please. Your Honor, yeah. Uh, I think to secure a BIR ICC, it takes two months of electronic billing to file with BIR. This okay. is the problem of all importers. So, and we don't know when and what's your timeline, when to release, and that's causing the delay. Okay, and then uh, LC, so two months with BIR, and we'll confirm it later. Uh, okay, and then afterwards, how many days with BOC? Just two days. So the it has to be two months also. Okay. We made it two days. So the BOC process, we were able to cut from two months to two days. Be not because of transparency, but because of criteria. Okay. And you made it simpler. Yes. Yes. Because you don't need Yeah, you don't need pictures of majority of stakeholders. And BOC agreed to that, no? Yes. Okay. So now we have BLR. Yes. So two months. Why does it take two months, okay. Attorney Asuncion, to get these permits out? Can't we cut this? Because, sa totoo lang, Halo-halo na po yung problema sa congestion, eh, no? People are saying congestion, but they actually mean BIR processes, no? So, halo-halo, could you give us an update regarding uh, this process? And are there any efforts to cut this down to, to two days as well? A total process of four days, to be very frank, other countries would still be long. But maybe here, we, the importers, would accept a four-day process, no? 
Yes, uh, um, Your Sanchez. Honor, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. San Vicente. Go ahead, Ms. San Vicente. Uh, actually, our revenue memorandum order requires us to process the application within 15 working days from receipt of the application. However, the problem with the current, with the sudden policy is that the volume of applicants surged. In July, in July, we received 13,000 applications when in fact our, the office that passes it doesn't have any increase in the personnel number of personnel that would process. Okay. <laughs> of course, the, uh, it's an internal problem, of yes. course. Uh, the, the, the remarks given earlier that it takes two months because of the electronic filing and payment system. Uh, this is the policy. For new importer, those who are not currently accredited by BOC, they are required to use the electronic filing and payment system for at least two consecutive months. That, that's the additional requirement. However, for those who are currently accredited with the BOC, uh, right now, we, we have the policy to issue the provisional ICC in order for them to proceed with the BOC. Because in the verification of that tax compliance, of their tax com compliance, we are for uh, offices, concerned offices, we find it hard to to check the their tax compliance because we check on ten criteria. There are ten criteria in the list uh, provided in Revenue Memorandum Order 10 2014. So that's the reason why it took us more than 15 working days to process a single application. Uh, have we? Okay. So I thank you, Ms. San Vicente, that you mentioned that it's an internal problem, no? Um, you know, one concern that uh, keeps on coming up are the agencies, and again, I'm not saying it's a bad regulation. In fact, I I support it. No, it's a good regulation. It will clean up, and I know that um, Commissioner and I have been trying to clean up as well, and uh, Commissioner Seville has been trying to clean up as well. But we need to look at our capacities also to implement. No, same issue with the FRB when they uh, had the. When they had the reform, which was to to cut down on the colorum or to crack down on the colorum, I don't think they realized that um, they have to issue in three months more than half of the current franchises needed to operate the the trade in in, in the Philippines. No, so that is a little much. So maybe they could have done or they could have uh, suggested another methodology to still achieve the reform but not disrupt uh, business. No? So let me ask. Are we improving? Has this been cut down? Because, for example, if we say, eh, kasi 15 people lang kami, 13,000 application. Have we asked for more people? Have we asked for more budget? Because this is this is really an important uh, matter, no, Attorney Asuncion? Your Honor, um, we'd like to clarify first. On the issuance, on the issuance of ICCs and BCCs to importers and brokers have been, was issued on February 2014. Um, however, we received a bulk of the uh, applications for the ICCs and BCCs. Day. Yes, and we have extended the deadline for already twi twice already. Um, the first one was we extended it to June 30, and then the next one was July 31. Okay, Sean, my, yes, my understanding is that um, most of these are now the applications are with you already, and it's yes. under process, no? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. So how 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 many thousands have we left have we uh, left to process? Yes. Um, in terms of these uh, permits, will give us uh, statistics on this. Uh, this report uh, is as of October 14. So as of October 14, we have received a total of 14,820,000 applications. Uh, the bulk of this is on July 31, we received around 13,000 applications. <laughs> as of the moment, we have outstanding and process of about 5,154 okay. applications and a total of almost 9,000 process already. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that number. So this 5,000, when will you be able to finish this 5,000? Can we expect it by the end of the month? We are targeting before the end of November. 2014, because this the, this 5,154 that was left behind are those who did not actually qualify with the criteria, but we are, we are going to send the notice of denial of their applications. Okay. 
itong 9,000 they have actual uh, ICCs already or provisional authorities? Uh, for the 9,000, the regular ICCs and BCCs issued is almost 2,000. So the bulk is provisional ICC or BCC. So, so technically, but, it's only 2,000 that you have actually Yes, processed. but the provisional ICC, there is also process processes have been made also mm -hmm. but we are just completing but before the end of the six months they don't have to reapply but because we are going to issue either the denial or the approval of their applications with before the six month period okay. end. So since February are you still at 15 members in your team or you've already uh, so, uh, I'd just like to clarify earlier this, the, Mr. Ernie said that we are 20 processing. The our division is composed of 31, okay. including the uh, chief and the assistant. But we have the uh, mandate to monitor the accounts receivable nationwide. In our uh, round, the revenue administrative order, the our function did not include this process. So back to the, yeah, yeah, Apart that's from the work. And, and I recommended actually for the uh, creation of a task force or a division to handle these processes in order that the to speed up the processing. Yeah. But uh, right now, because the budget has already been done for 2014, we cannot hire additional people to handle these processes. So maybe, yeah, yun nga, internal problem talaga, no? Uh, in, 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 kasi yung problem, I, I don't, I don't, I just, I, I'm sure I don't need to explain this further, no? But of course, you know, your capacity problem is affecting everyone, no? So, um, this was my suggestion in, in a previous hearing. Yes, yes. Why, why can't we, you know, if we're instituting a new reform, Napaplano rin ba na yung implementation ng reform na yun and our capacity to actually complete all of these reforms at the at the right time with the least amount of um, of uh, disruption in the market, for example? Uh, I think, Your Honor, um, most of the applications that have not been processed or is still pending processing, um, most of the importers or the brokers have problems with uh, their clearances with the RDOs and the, um, the collection division of the regions. Um, so they, they still have to, they have outstanding tax liabilities that they still have to um, uh, clarify and pay or they have pending assessments that they have to settle. That's why we're, uh, that's why... And we're sure the these aren't new assessments, huh? These aren't suddenly my bank assessments. No, Your yeah. Honor. Some of them have um, open cases. They have not filed their okay. their forms. That's why uh, it's taking long for the RDOs to forward to us their clearances. That's okay. why, that's part of the... Let, let me ask just quickly, uh, Ernie and then Attorney Louie, and then maybe see Ms. Zapata would want to give a comment also. Ernie. Mr. Chair, I am an admirer of Ms. San Vicente. I admire her because she asked for people, she didn't get it. I admire her because she has amendments to this, it was not entertained. However, the secret is what you said in the last hearing. Let the private sector come in. My God, they know time and motion study, etc., etc. And actually, Mr. Chair, I have my hand which I'll submit to you. There are four things they want here that they already have. There is one, just to ask to talk to you, you know, how, how some people who don't understand private sector. They want a written justification as to why you have a space sharing arrangement. You don't. <laughs> what are they doing? When you auntie took over as president of Kino, it was $3 billion. I was in charge of investments. It went to $400 billion. All I did was cut out unnecessary stuff. Fire Thailand and we shut up. This deja vu. This is like the Marcos system where the, the, the people come in, they don't ask the private sector. Therefore, my claim, our claim to fame is time and motion study. We have done it with customs. We succeeded. We're just now going to go to Kim and Aris. But the beauty is this. Miss San Vicente is behind us in asking the people, even it's a marriage, which I will give you, right? Four people they want here, they already have. They're going to ask us to do it again? I mean, justification. Why do you have to know everything? Justification, why are you going to have a contract? It's ridiculous. It's, it's like Marcos' time. Actually, okay. <laughs> so long, yeah. uh, we look forward to meeting with them because San Vicente is someone I admire. I think we can push it. We okay. check with Almendra. So, so, so kayo with the private sector already, no? We just okay. started. We just started. Okay. Hopefully, we'll have better uh, things to mention in the next uh, the next hearing. No. Uh, so, yeah, let me just 
go to Louis. Yes, go ahead, Louis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just like to put on record I'm actually here attending for the truckers, but I do have experience with uh, importer accreditation. And um, one of the things that uh, are really being complained about by the importers is uh, being a new importer, you are required to have to at least have two months of EFPS compliance. And uh, just getting to EFPS and applying for the system takes some time. And we totally understand the volume involved in uh, being processed in the BIR. But this basically means that you have at least a minimum of two months before you start operating. So uh, in my experience, uh, one of my clients actually turned around and said, never mind, we're not going to push through with this. This is too much of a hassle. So, okay. Maybe. Thank you, Louie. Uh, Ms. Zapata. Yes, consistently, kami talaga dyan sa accreditation with the BOC alone. We are not in conformity with that. Our logic is that, why will you make things hard for the importers to bring in cargo so long that you have to pay and declare it right? During the, tendency, uh, during the tenure of your President Cory Aquino, there was no such accreditation as tedious as now, but there was no such thing as rampant as we have now of the smuggling and the scandal that we are having right now. Uh, the, for, uh, for, uh, for the BOC and the BIR, making things hard for the accreditation, it's not helping with the importer, and everybody is against it. I can say that. Let me do this. Okay, Elsie will give you the last okay. word. Uh, don't forget about the empties, because really we have to focus. <laughs> okay, 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 we won't forget about the empties. Now, we've, we're trying to, we're, we're actually trying to um, look at all of the avenues now. Definitely the empties are important, accountability of the shipping lines, but we're also looking at processes now. No? Okay. So we're looking at the legal which probably uh, can be cut down. Um, anyway, BOC, we found that they could be, it could be cut down. It's working there. So maybe we can also look at the... Anyway, those are suggestions of uh, your office already, you know, Ms. San Vicente, no? Gawin mo rin sa inyo yung suggestions na yan, how to cut down the process, right? Uh, uh, so, yes, there are. Okay. So maybe we can look into this, no? Because, uh, again, no, sa taong bayan kasi... It's all called congestion, but all of these processes actually lead to the to the slowdown of the goods and services, no? Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair last, who would monitor this? Well, we're going to get to there. Malayo pa tayo, mga kaibigan. I hope you have lunch because we still have the medium and long term solutions, no? I'd like now to go to the under the table. No? And let me, since you're talking, let, let me ask you first. Uh, there are the formal charges which increased. And we'll be taking a look at that, trying to solve it through the MPs and convening the shipping lines. What about the informal or under the table charges? Actually, it's really happening long before. Yes. Uh, before it started only with the trackers, maybe better the trackers to speak up. Pakikisama, uh, for merienda, maybe for 100. But now, people are taking advantage of it because they know uh, the frustration of how to return the empties. So, even though you have the pre-alert advice, but if you don't do this under the table, they will not accept your empties. So, force to good to give it to them. Okay. Uh, but, okay, to add, in trackers mismo yung yung hinihinga niya, no? Kasi yung driver yan, di ba? O, what? Uh, Sino ba mismo yung... Meron, marami hong hinihinga sa pier, no? Like, for example, pag, pag di-deliver na ng uh, container, uh, normally, para may delivery, para may karga yung container sa truck, may transaksyon. No? Uh, may, may transaksyon nangyayari. Pag sasawali ng container sa container yard, may transaksyon nangyayari. Habang nasa kalsada yung truck, Paparahin niya ng enforcer, may transaksyon na ngayon eh. Yun. Uh, sino yan? Sino yung... Depende kung saan yung... Ito ba? Depende sino? Kasi iba iba. Understanding ko iba iba. Like for iba? example, uh, uh, may mga complaints. Uh, like, papasok pa lang sa loob ng pier. Depende ko sa ang pier, no? Papasok pa lang sa loob ng pier, yung security guard, eh, nakikipagtransaksyon na sa inyo. Why don't you give us ano, a rundown? Oh, aalis yung truck mula sa garahe. Dating sa gate. First point, meron na. Meron na. Eh. Okay, next. Mm -hmm. Then, pag, pagdating dun sa loob, may taburon. 
um, ilalagay mo yung transaction fee do sa tabo then para magic yun gagalaw na ngayon yung mga dapat gumalaw ay tapos Then, of course, right. okay. ako na lang magsasabi, hindi mo na hindi mo sinasabi yung mga detalye. Okay, I'll say this, you want to go to the details. Go. Ganito, ganito yun, Senator Nob. I'll go by decade. In the 1980s, ang style dyan is, yung tracker pa lang, lalagyan mo na para lang gumalaw, lalo na sa gabi. Pupunta sa pier yan, pier namin, pier nila, anybody's pier, hahanapin mo pa yung equipo, wala yung Operator, hahanapin mo yung operator na sa kantin, bibigyan mo yan ng isang libo. Ha? 1989, 1990, ganyan. Agree, mga isang libo yung nung araw, that was about 25 pesos to, to a dollar. So what people used to pay in bribes to the operators in the terminals were far more than what you paid the Arastre contractor. Go into computerization. What computerization did, late 90s, was it automated the processes at the gate and um, uh, inside the terminal. What then happened was the people before who used to pay 1,000 and were charging 1,200 to the importer, pinapatungan yung lagay, ngayon wala nang rason mag, ano, mag, maglagay, no? Pero tinutuloy pa rin yan. But through education of uh, explaining it to the brokers and the truck drivers and everything, that went down to more or less 500, 300, ganon, late 90s. Okay. Um, as the terminals got busier and busier and busier, instead of the money being passed on in the terminals for movement, people started passing money on to get documents to flow faster at the billing offices uh, I, wherever you have paper no so the next the next trend there was to eliminate all the paper so now there's no longer paper there's no interaction with any operators uh, there's no more interaction at the gate because there's nobody so what happens nagahanap na lang sila ng sulok diyan sa ano diyan sa yung iba Nagahanap na sulok sa mga equipo kahit walang tao nagiiwan ng pera yan. Okay? Um, that's become small. 20, 50, 100, wherever it happens, whatever peer, whatever CY, I, I don't know. Okay? That, that's a minuscule amount. The real problems now are people collecting money, okay? Um, and we know where. Elsie can explain this very well. Um, people collecting money promising that they will um, effectively trigger a transaction that in reality has already been approved. That's where the problem is. Eh? That's why they put up the, the traffic light system. No? You'll be told as an importer, as a trucker, hindi ka pwede dyan. Pero kung bibigyan mo ako ng ano, lalaba, hindi, makakapasok ka. When in reality, makakapasok talaga siya, pero wala siyang visibility. That's why they put up, that's why we've been putting up these systems. Another place that the lines naman are making reklamo is with the berthing. They're saying, hindi makakapasok yung barko ko kapag walang lagay. Eh, sino ang dinalagyan mo? Ang, uh, yun, yun ang tanong ko. Ang, say, yung iba nagsasabi si Christian Gonzalez. Eh. <laughs> so, so what, what the, the, the real problem now is the manipulation of information to create an environment where you feel You have to give money for transactions to move, which in practi all practical purposes is not true. Okay, for, let me clarify first. These are government people. These are people in the port. Um, people related, to, private sector related to moving containers. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 and everybody is guilty here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, 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 uh, if someone takes a truck into ICTSI, I guarantee you my security guard na humihingi ng pera. I guarantee Mm -hmm. And you can't do anything about it. No, what we what we ask th this is a whole this is a whole culture eh? where we can automate we automate right which you saw yourself. You cannot automate a, a security guard, a traffic enforcer, and the parola. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you need the guy with the gun. But then you tell the people, give me the name, give me a picture. Everybody has cell phones. Begin mo ako ng pangalan. The next day tanggal yan. Walang nagbibigay ng ano. Walang nagbibigay ng pangalan. 
Okay. Bakit? Yung iba kasi pinapatungan yun. So, okay. One common question is, who do people go to? Who do you go to? Kayo na kami pupunta. Okay. If it is somebody related to your ports, who do they go to? And we're talking about, hindi mo na government uh, personnel, non-government personnel, who do they go to? With, with, uh, with the trucking associations, they have an open for, for traffic related uh, supposed lagays and things like that. They have an open door to myself. Because as far as we're concerned, that's totally unacceptable. So when someone is transparent about what guard it was or what barangay tanod it was or whoever, we take action right away. The, the problem is there's a next step where the cost is extremely expensive and that's in the return of the empties. And that is often not the line, definitely not the terminal Who's contractor, that? subcontractor. Subcontractor of? Shipping line. Or oh, if, if, for example, it's a member, okay, so you're saying around the port and vicinity, same with Sean, I guess, no? They can go to you and you will do something about it. For sure. PPA, do you, have, uh, do you want to comment on that? Or, or you're in partnership already with the port operators here, no? So, okay. If it's the shipping line, it's a sa agente, yung agente or yung subcontractor or whatever. Whoever it may be. Who do they go to? Do they go to PPA? Do they go to Task Force Pantalan? Who do they go to? No, what you say is for uh, Sorry, Capsec, I'm putting you on the spot. At this point, maybe he might develop another now, Task Force eventually. As of now, you know, there's none. We're, we're studying a few options, and I'm sorry it is uh, in order to catch these very innovative people, we cannot divulge our plans, but definitely there is something being studied. Uh, there's there's a few more issues oh. that, that we should that can probably come out, no? okay. including the facilitation of certain documents. And sorry, our our good friends in customs are also uh, are also need. I am working very closely with uh, with Commissioner Sibilia, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. Commissioner Sibilia would also admit that we also have our own problems on that side. Now, sir, we're going to get to the on the government side, uh, but just on the private sector side first. Um, so for the record, no, and for our practice here, because I'm understanding that trackers naman mismo yung nagbibigay at hinihingan, de ba? So if it's barangay pano personnel of the ports, we can go to operators directly. But ang understanding ko rin kasi is that previously, parang tip yan, kaya you don't mind and they don't mind, no? Nung no, araw, tip lang yan. Pero ngayon, eh. Obligasyon. Naging obligasyon eh. Naging obligasyon, di ba? Okay. If it's from the shipping lines, do you concur with that? Na it's uh, personnel of the shipping lines? Yes, yeah, well, there are also situations where the personnel of the shipping lines uh, nakikipag-transaksyon. Like for example, in the return of empty containers, uh, sasabihin ng checker ng shipping lines, eh, wala na, walang lugar. Pero pagka may transaksyon, may lugar. lugar. Yes. Yun. So in, in that case, as a tracker, ano pang gagawin mo? Ay, magbibigay ka na para may offload yung container. Okay. In terms of information gathering, at least for the tracking association, there are three tracking associations yes. here, di ba? Uh -huh. Would you be willing to work with government in terms of divulging kung kaninong personal ng shipping lines yan? Sure. Opo. Okay. So, you, we, we can, maybe DTI, since you're the one talking to the shipping lines, you can share to them that, oh, itong mga tao ninyo, ito yung kumikita ang design. Baka kasi malaki pa sa sweldo nila. It's a known fact, uh, Your Honor. In fact, we've been telling the shipping lines ex executives, baka mas mayaman pa sa inyo yung mga checkers ninyo. Eh. Hmm. So, can that be part of the, your discussion with the shipping lines? You said, Dimagi ba? We'll, we'll include that. Okay, and we want to see actual action plan here. Right? Kasi, bakit po yun, out of sight, out of mind. No? I mean, as long as my business gets done, I don't care, diba? But they have to care because this is stopping a lot of our interests, no? Uh, yes, Kapsik. I just want to compliment, no? The, the reason why we were able to solve the kotong outside the... I need to be very careful how to say this, Bert. The way we were able to solve one of the transactions outside the gates was because the truckers were honest enough to tell me where it was happening and how it was happening. And then we took very drastic actions. Of course, we were significantly criticized. But I'd like to think that that, that is proof that 
if the pro the truckers or the private sector is willing to come up and say where, when, how, that gives us the opportunity to operate. It is not good for our health or our well-being, but it is, we proved it can be done. So, Bert, no? you agree to that, uh, ACTO agrees to that, that when the eventually the truth came out, then we were able to address it. But I guess that's what we're trying to do here, create a mechanism wherein all these issues can be appropriately covered. And uh, Senator, I, I assure you we are studying options. Okay, maybe as a sorry, Arcadia. Maybe as a final point on this topic, uh, we can go to the. Siguro mas masalimu the discussion regarding government, naman, no? And we have the importers here. Uh, they uh, promise that uh, they may not necessarily name a name, but at least in terms of agencies, not to get to the bottom of this, no? So, Elsie, baka sumubo, baka yuken, no? Share with us. Um, with regard to the experiences of uh, FFCCII, no? Um, our members... And, and first of all, you concur that on the private sector side, in the discussion, natin, in your experience, we are not leaving out anyone. Yeah. Okay. Our problem is, uh, especially the small business people, uh, this is their complaint, especially for new uh, businessmen, they have to file with BIR, and how do we be accredited? That's why they cannot access the electronic filing because they're not accredited yet. So that is their dilemma. They cannot do the process because they're not yet accredited. So there's no accreditation and they will ask you the track record of your importation. How can you give the track record? But this, is in, this is basically inefficiency or a lack of understanding. No, this is not under the table. No, Just it's to be not clear. under the table. Okay. But because of this, that create corruption again. Uh, what do you mean? I don't know. I, I don't do the process, but I heard instead of going through the formal process line, they talk to the people in that building, and they will do all the process. So, we're yes, talking about that. And this is for BIR? I think so. Okay. Because they cannot be accredited. There's no track record. Okay. Is that all? Uh, another... I'm sorry. For the old businessman, because of um, they cannot meet the deadline for the BOC on the July 31, so uh, all custom licenses are already stopped. So because of that, sometimes because the goods are, how you call that, part of the overflow stock in Hong Kong, Singapore, they start coming after August 31. So come August 31, because of that, they become an abandoned because their license is not finished yet. So this, again, create corruption. Uh, Ms. Zapata? It's true. The problem is that, uh, with due respect with our friend from the BOC, uh, attorney is saying that to process with the BOC is easy by now. But uh, there are some uh, improvements on other side, but on the processing of the cargo itself, I will just would like to give a very, very good example. Before, if you are a regular importer of an electronics, say, brand of GE, and it had been established the transaction with the Bureau that you don't have any derogatory information, Bureau of Customs releases right after presentation of your application of ICE, of your uh, DTI clearance. Now, Customs are not allowing the release of that uh, regular cargo importation of yours unless you will get the clearance from the uh, DTI. And the clearance now takes two weeks before you can get it. So. It contributes again to the port congestion. Oh, but this is a legal process, no? Na mabagal. You're saying mabagal. Hindi to ni pa to corruption. I there. Uh, be clear. Course. Be clear. Uh, uh, Senator, anything that uh, they are, any process that uh, any government office is making hard and too much discretion on anybody in there, it entails corruption. So just to be clear, uh, Ms. Zapata, are you saying? that there are issues with BOC and DTI, or just BOC, or just DTI? Both with DTI. Uh, well, 
before wait, wait. it is being done through electronics application of our clearance with the DTI, we can view it. And that is what we are telling with the BOC. Oh, here is our application duly acknowledged with DTI. Can you accept this? And you can view it. Uh, our, uh, our certification is not yet ready and it's not yet released by the T DTI because before it's being allowed by the BOC by now because they come up with the newspaper clip, uh, pronouncement that uh, DTI is, is strictly monitoring that kind of process. Uh, well, the BOC got, uh, no, got a hard time of letting your cargo out. All right. Okay, we're going to ask the, wait lang, uh, Yusek, no? Lalala natin na muna natin, no? Well, this is the first time that I heard uh, DTI was mentioned, no? But, okay, but just a second, uh, first of all, let me acknowledge Congresswoman Bunuan of the 4th District of Manila. Thank you for coming, uh, Congresswoman. Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, from the truckers, anybody else want to comment? This is a matter of transparency. I'm just trying to be transparent here. I know everyone says, I don't know, or... Well, I don't know we don't say everyone in the agency, but there are elements, no? Does anyone else want to comment? Okay, we'll ask the agencies to respond. Uh, yes, Pedro. Mr. Uh, Jay, uh, I also represent one importer. And uh, uh, just for the info to the committee, uh, prior to, to, uh, to, to, to this year, there's no requirement for accreditation for importers with the BR. And uh, a lot of importers are are complaining that this is an additional layer and uh, I guess if the, the purpose of uh, the requirement is uh, can be achieved by other means probably BIR should take a look a second look on that okay but this, another layer, eh? this is a one-time requirement right also every year um every three years your honor every three years okay so we will allow the agencies to respond and um you know, please consider this as a, as a cry for help no, from the private sector. Because oftentimes, the common response is, kayo na kami pupunta. Oh, yun, 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 pa rin pati ng padami. But um, please take this into consideration because we will be checking up on this, no? And I, I, I believe, uh, as well as, um, well, Secretary Mendes also mentioned it once in an article that we need to solve this issue of um, corruption to really solve this issue of congestion because they go hand in hand. Eh. Uh, the more things are unwieldy and inefficient, the more that there becomes, th there has a chance for this type of corruption. No? In a perfectly efficient system, there will be no chances for corruption, probably less chances of corruption. So we are moving towards efficiency, but at the same time, we need to call the agencies to task also. So let me start with the... Uh, Yusek de Mariba, could you kindly respond to Mr. Zapata? Then we'll ask uh, Attorney Asuncion and then um, Attorney Corpus to respond as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time, I will volunteer to share the information. You know, I think the, the electronic transaction, the Bureau of Customs, really helped government in uh, curbing uh, smuggling activities. I think for the information of the importers group in this uh, room right now, in July alone, Mr. Chairman, when, we were, when DTI was given access to the website of the Bureau of Customs, all products that would require DTI certification, those that would require the permit that I heard some said uh, is required, of those who came in and released from the customs, only less than 2% were issued DTI clearances. That means, Mr. Chairman, 98% of products that should have passed testing did not. So, for the past three months, Mr. Chairman, BOC and DTI to our Bureau of Philippine Standards have really tightened, tightened the process, you know. In fact, from a mislead testing applications we usually receive because BOC had tightened the process, the Bureau is now receiving close to 100 applications for import commodity clearance. What does it mean? It means that those legitimate importers or those not so legitimate people have to go through us because those cargo will not be cleared by the Bureau of Customs. One example, 
this thing keep coming back and forth. So many people that intervene, government officials, past government officials, plywood. No? Plywood. A lot of plywood came out, and a lot of plywood is still there inside the custom. So I guess before, I think private sector should look also at the infrastructure the government had put in place. The electronic, the electronic transaction, the bureau customs, the BR importers clearance certificate, these are really directed towards screening. Screening the not so good from the good. The not so good, they have a chance to be a good importer. Yung dala na ayaw maging good, ewan na lang nga sila magtanda. Hey, actually, Yusek, no, on that note, I don't think anyone is uh, saying that that policy is wrong. Yeah. In fact, I think if it's done correctly, it's wonderful, no? Yeah. But uh, maybe the concern is really to make sure that the implementation is not taken advantage of by elements who want to earn on the side. Yeah. So maybe and, that's and what, uh, you know, because the, the kasama ko ho kasi sale, we check a lot of goods in the market. And unfortunately, marami talagang substandard, no? Everything from Christmas lights to metal bars to... We check that regularly, di ba? So, having tighter controls is a good thing. But we just need to make sure that people are not taking advantage of that, no? So, could our, you... Our turnaround of import commodity clearance at event, the chairman, is not more than three days. If an application takes more than three days, the following things may happen. One, incomplete documents. Two, the customs brokers. They play a lot because under our law, import entry have to be signed by the import by a customs broker, not only by the importer. Sometimes, you know, they want to earn more money, more billing time. They apply with the office ten applications. They want to come back every day. While the papers have been approved, they will not pick up the paper because that guy would like to claim maybe a daily expense statement for ten days. But they can get it one day. So things like that. But our turnaround, our turnaround time is not more than three days, Mr. Chairman. D definitely. Um, Attorney Asuncion, there's been a, should we say a complaint or a report? Maybe a report from one of the members of um, FFCCII that there are fixers in your office. Are you looking, can you look into that? Um, yes, I, preliminary to this, Your Honor, um, uh, as a statement of the BIR, um, I, we really feel that it is unfortunate that um, the, our, new requir our new requirement um, comes uh, at a time when there's a problem with the our ports with, with the congestion. Um, but as uh, Secretary Almendras and Yusik de Magiba highlighted, these are reforms that are instituted to curb out smuggling, um, improve tax compliance and tax mapping of importers and brokers, which are before, um, although they were regulated, um, it is not as strict and as um, uh, thorough as it is now. Um, it should be noted that prior to July 31, we have issued 3,000 3, um, clearances um, to brokers and importers, and we have uh, issued 5,000 after this period. And we're looking at finishing uh, the issuance of the clearances the, uh, by the end of November. Um, as to, I, I would like to agree with Yusek Gidemagiba when he said that um, this also gives a chance to those who are bad in their compliance um, with their tax compliance on um, like importers who are importers or brokers who have not complied with their um, compliances with the bureau or with their ta with their tax liabilities too. Um, this gives them a chance to be uh, in the good. Okay. So basically, that's it. Um, on the side of corruption, um, our commissioner has always been very adamant on uh, against fixers uh, within the bureau. And recently, there have been uh, personnel who have been or, who are being investigated on this. Um, we would really appreciate it if um, the importers or the brokers who are uh, um, uh, what's this? Uh, being abused by personnel to come forward and report the these erring officials or officers to our commissioner or to the proper office within the bureau. Um, we also would like to highlight that sometimes um, it is also with the importers or the 
uh, brokers themselves that are that go to these personnel and they ask for uh, they ask these personnel to do them favors. Um, I think um, corruption is two way and um, both ways dapat uh, matapos din po siya. Okay. No, Thank you. understandably no. And in fact, uh, Attorney Sonshon, I'm not even. In fact, I think the the reforms are good. No, it's really more in terms of having a more efficient implementation, which is not um, not bereft of the current market situation. And secondly, that we make sure that no one is taking advantage of the situation. No, because yung isang common theme na lumalabas dito is that ang lami talagang uh, nagtake advantage to support congestion natin. No. Um, just because uh, you know we have the port congestion, uh, everyone from the private sector to, the, to some elements in government really took advantage, diba? And that's something that we don't want to see, at least on, on both parties. Now, if, for example, these importers do uh, give an anonymous tip that it's this person who is uh, a fixer, and you go through the right due process, will they still see that person two months later still in the same office? Or is something going to be done about it? That's really, I think, the concern. Because the reason why a lot of these complaints, uh, they don't push through with the complaints because even after they complain, the same personnel are still there. Diba? So in, in BLR, is there a special office that really handles these complaints or is it just uh, the commissioner's office? Um, our internal investigation division handles all these complaints. Um, of of about these airing officials or employees of the bureau, Your okay. Honor. We we'd like to ask. Um, maybe you can ask them to also join us in the in the next hearing, and we'd like to get some data. No, apart from all of the complaints, how many were convicted? How many were actually charged? Meron ba talaga ng yari o wala? No, because that's really the and this goes the same for customs as well. No, um, we would like to see that. Uh, these elements are actually lessened or, or, or they're brought to justice. No? So, ganto, here's a commitment. If um, the importers here were willing to share with you information, in our next hearing, could you give us an update regarding the case of that person? Would you be bold enough to say that you're willing to go through this process with us? Because we want to test. No? We want a test case. If, if the Aduana Business Club, and maybe it can be anonymous, one of your members, or even FFCCII, they provide the right information, they get their lawyers to provide information. In our next hearing, we'll want an update kung may nangyari o wala dun sa taong yun. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes, yeah, you say. Yeah, we, we uh, share with that. Uh, if importers have information on DTA employees, uh, particularly on this certification thing, uh, please report it to us. And I'd like to put on record that we charge one employee now. Okay. The NBI charged falsification before the Ombudsman, and I have uh, issued the uh, administrative charge. And uh, you said uh, whether that employee will still be there. Of course, through the process, uh, we're considering issuing a preventive suspension. Okay. So Thank I reiterate you. your call, importers here. If you believe an employee or employees are in connivance with brokers, trying to fake documents. There are many fake conditional releases in import community. Please report it to us. I mean, we cannot just keep on reporting, crying, and if we don't walk the talk, I mean, uh, we cannot also catch them. It's so difficult to catch a tip, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Yusek. Attorney Asuncion? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the Commissioner has always been very um, adamant on beating fixers within the Bureau. Um, the same way that Yusek the uh, Magiba calls for the importers and the brokers. Um, we would really appreciate it if they would report. Um, and of course, the the proper office in the bureau will really act on this, Your Honor. Thank you, um, Attorney Corpus. Care to comment, or would you also join uh, our government officials in their uh, request to get information? Of course, sir. Uh, our commissioner has been chief acting in regarding complaints against employees. And we have a specific division in our intelligence division to work on this. Okay. So, okay. Maybe the committee can be the referee here, you know. If, if the importers feel it's safer to give the committee the information, we will forward it to the proper agencies. And then we'll follow up in our next hearing kung uh, ano yung status ng mga complaints na yun. Para they, they have a... Tama ba talagang So you feel a little... Uh, so that the importers will also feel safe to divulge this information. No? Okay, yes, Secretary. Your Honor, sorry, in the interest of looking for solutions to the corruption, 
may I ask the importers, how is the payoff done? I doubt if the importer himself is the one who will hold the money and give it to the person. Okay, good question. So who is the throughput? Who is the Go between. middleman? Who is the one that tells the importer, ito yung kailangan kong pera kasi ibabayad ko dito. Okay. All transactions course through brokers. That being on record, Mr. Chairman, I have called the pro I have already requested the Professional Regulation Commission because they are apparently the only one that has supervision over these brokers to a meeting this afternoon. Because that is the reason why we want to solve the processes. Uh, in as much as BIR and DOF are tightening on the importers, I, I feel for the importers. Once upon a time, I was also on that side, Your Honor. Uh, maybe if we can tighten on the on that middle role, since we all required every importation to be to be coursed through, then things can go through. Because I have heard stories of uh, there are good brokers and there are very good brokers. So, uh, see, in in all honesty, this should have been a market force. Now, if you're not happy with your broker, go find a better broker. But apparently, it's not. There are there are also brokers who specialize on the other side. So the intention now is we must find a way to put this together. And so I, I needed that on record because okay. I need to take action on how to establish a good regulatory and control framework to establish a higher standard for a broker. A security guard in the port cannot become a licensed custom broker, for heaven's sake. What is it? Where is the office? What is the business model that, that allowed that? So thank, thank you, Kapsek. Okay, we're going to leave this topic now and then go to our final topic. Yes, just quickly. Um, I, I just want to put this on record. Our, our capacity is constrained by the amount of time the containers stay in the ports or the length it takes for the empties to get back in. This is constrained by procedures. These procedures are constrained by corruption and paper. I think that DOTC and DOF should put together um, a regulation that's rolled out over the next couple of years requiring everybody involved in the process of moving containers to eliminate human contact and paper to, to ensure that within, by 2016, for example, you go to get to pay to get your container, you see not one person, and you do not process one single paper. It's doable, Mr. Sanders. That's very doable. And, um, you know, again, we go back now. What are the above the formal impediments and what are the informal impediments? That's the same thing, no? Okay, we're going to go to our final Mr. topic. Chair, I must say this. Uh, yes, uh, Ernie. Uh, I'm sorry. This is very important. There are bad making a guy and very bad making a guy as compared to good, very uh, better. The bad ones do it because the requirement is so ridiculous. And rather than go through this and lose all your business, they may cry. Those are the bad. The very bad screw them. They're smugglers. We hate them, right? But I will talk to Mr. Corpus. I was outside the door. In other words, Mr. Chair, as you hold accountable the people here, on making the systems and reports. I want you to hold accountable the government people here. And I think they should show you the improvement in their system. And Mr. Corpus will tell you. Sabi ko, anong transparent yung sasabi mo? Pare, criteria yan. Pinalit natin. Oh, ganun din po. Ang BR, tingnan po natin. Next time we meet, let's see if they made a change. If they did not make a change, if they did not make a change and bring it down, and the reporters are still there, you must understand the bad. They'd rather pay and risk then lose all their business. So I'd like to ha have that accountable. Let us see the improvement in procedures, and we can do that because Ms. San Vicente is my heroine. Okay, thank you. I, Senator Shirt. Hindi siya naniniwala sa'yo, Attorney Ernie. Yes, Shirt, please. Uh, okay. Kasi ang sinasabi, what they are saying is, uh, that's why they are imposing a very strict way of the accreditation, both BOC and BRS2. <laughs> card is smuggling. Ang sinasabi nga namin dito, for so long a time, bakit hindi pa kayo nag-profiling? Kung 15,000, 17,000 yung importer na yan, they are not all smugglers. Bakit yung activity, kung ang smuggler do, 2,000 lang, bakit kami 15,000 pati makakasali? So, I think that is the best and easier approach. Profiling, profile who are transacting with the Bureau and with the BIR. Just out of curiosity, did you already, do you already have your ICC? Yes, we have. How long is the process of it? It's long and short because there is a way to be short. 
yung yung sige hindi na okay. Uh, let me go uh, mag-usap na lang ako kayo after. I- yes. Uh, but that's my point, no. Nangyayari talaga yan because the processes are too long. And if you make it difficult for the people who want to comply to do the right thing, it's a disincentive to do the right thing. We should make it simple so that the people who want to do the right thing can do the right thing. The people who want to pay properly can pay properly. Diba? Okay. Let's go to the last point. And, um, you know, I, 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 maybe we'll have about, just unfortunately, just about 15 minutes for this. But we'd like to start talking about medium and long-term solutions. And it's good that the OTC is here. Uh, Ms. De La Cruz, government has a national transport plan, right? Yes. Um, that's what... As of what date, Yan? Was that uh, 2010 or what, what date was that made? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not ready with the transport plan. Because okay. I right, so I'm not asking you to present, no, but um, I'm just wondering, the, the National Transport Plan of the Philippines, no, do, we, do we have that on record? Could you provide the committee uh, a copy of that or at least the stakeholders here as well? Sir, I will uh, endorse this to the Transport Planning Division of the Department and we will provide the committee. Okay. Um, so if I, if I were to ask you today to comment on medium and long-term solutions to these issues, would you, would you be ready to comment already or hindi pa? I'm not yet ready, sir, because we have the all. Uh, other aside from the Transport Planning of the Department, I came from the legal division of the department. Okay, so legally speaking, do you have the transport? I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll, in the next hearing, no? And, and if, if, let's have someone from the planning office or maybe Secretary by himself to, to explain our transport plan. By that time, I'm hoping that our short-term solutions have already taken effect and we can now move to the medium and long-term solutions. No? But I think what's key here is that our transport plan coincides with our economic growth and with our infrastructure needs, no? Yes, sir. Um, it can't be developed in a vacuum. It has to be developed with all of these different, um, all of these different factors involved also. So yes, we, we'll, we'll have the OTC to present that in the next hearing. Can you use superstars in the next hearing? Natin and I will we'll, we'll report this to the department, sir. Okay. Um, before I go to Kabzek, because he has some ideas on the medium and long-term solutions, no? let me ask Richard to, to just quickly... Uh, present this uh, idea that they raised previously about the connector road or uh, anyway you have the floor Richard well uh, we've been talking about all the issues which affect uh, congestion but whatever we do in the short term does not really help too much for the longer term with the growth because with the highways which are being uh, uh, proposed at the moment which are good and a lot of them are underway and it's a very positive step is that there's still no, no full uh, uh, plan which has been uh, confirmed for an elevated connector road into the ports themselves. I've uh, chatted with uh, Christian before who's uh, on this and we're, and with Sean and we're all, we're all supportive of this. Um, uh, now it's a question of where does it go and how long does it take to bring about. I did attend a business forum uh, a couple of months ago where uh, Secretary Sing Song was there with Secretary Abaya, and this was uh, discussed, and, and Secretary Sing Song was uh, very supportive of it. But there, uh, as you know, the uh, Skyway projects for Stage 3 are already underway, and they're already working uh, uh, to complete these, and uh, going along quite well, as I understand it. Uh, but on those there, if we could have an elevated link into the ports themselves from there, uh, even if it could be negotiated with the existing contractor as a variation to their contract, these things could be in by the end of 2016. Richard, you had the slide uh, showing the road, right? Could we, could we show that? No, so that people are not lost in the discussion. No? And I'd like to... This is one solution no, that, that could probably uh, support yeah, our I think, issues. I think right? Unless there's an elevated Skyway connection, yeah. it, it cannot be solved. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, that's where it is at the moment. Uh, if you see Skyway Stage 3, which comes all the way down from... Uh, from Could you use the mic, Richard, please? Sorry. Skyway Stage 3, which is coming all the way down from EDSA, all the way down to uh, 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 Slex uh, there. If, if we could have an elevated uh, 
Skyway or uh, roadway, I should say, connecting into the ports, that would go a massive way to um, uh, uh, reducing the port, con uh, the port congestion on the roads. And it would help much more for having uh, uh, truck appointment systems as well, because there'd be more regular traffic programs. Uh, uh, as I mentioned just now, the, um, the stage three skyway, as you know, has already been awarded, it's already being constructed, and if there's any way the government could see their way to uh, maybe negotiating with the, uh, the contractor there for this, to have connections into the port, and uh, how did this come about? There could be meetings with, uh, uh, with uh, PPA and uh, ICTSI, uh, uh, ATI, and ourselves, and of course the trucking associations to make sure what does go in uh, will uh, work for not just entering the port, but leaving the port as well. I think this will go way, a long way to uh, uh, protecting ourselves for the future. Sure, there's going to be some disruption while these are going up, but uh, if we don't address it now, in four, two, three years, five years' time, it'd be worse because we all know the growth in transport or volume through the ports is around about five to six percent per, uh, per year. So this is what uh, was we're. Uh, uh, su suggesting uh, and uh, Richard, no, it's, it's just not that clear in, in this picture, no. But basically, this is a uh, a connector road springing from the NLX SLEX. Sorry, from stage three. Uh, from stage three. Mm -hmm. No, but where will that? Won't it connect? I, I, I can there, there, that there, one, no. There. You see, this is just one example. Uh, it needs to be looked at, of course. Of course, no. But basically, example. a direct elevated highway to the three ports. Yeah that connect to our main highways. That's right. So you bypass all of the Manila traffic. That's correct. That, that's the basic yeah. idea, right? Because at the moment, R10, which goes all the way through to uh, Manila Hotel with the various, and, and the circle, is for every piece of transport moving there, and that's where the congestion takes place. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's one suggestion. Uh, yes, Michael? First of all, we fully endorse that uh, suggestion as a medium to long-term solution. It's a... Uh, very interesting to hear that uh, we that you believe that it ca can be done until end of uh, 2016, but probably so because the construction of the connector road between SLEX and NLEX has uh, started already. But if you uh, just give me two minutes because we have some specific uh, specific recommendations. I don't want to go to delve any more in in, in uh, nitty gritty details, but. One thing is important: the root cause of this problem is not the capacity of the ports. Right now, the ports have enough capacity. Everybody has enough capacity, but the root cause is the loss of productivity of trucking. Because before, each and every truck was able to deliver about 25 container vans a month. That number went down to about 10 to 11 at the worst, at the peak of the, uh, of the problem. There have been a lot of improvements also because of the commendable uh, work of uh, Secretary Almendras and his team. Okay, I mean, we, we, the 24 by 7 truck lanes were imposed. We have straight lines uh, right now where before you had circumventious uh, routes and things like that. A lot of things have been done. The productivity went back from about 10 to 11 to, I would estimate right now, right, uh, now to about 13, maybe 14. Truckers associations could probably uh, uh, comment on that. But that's the root cause of the problem, and that is where everything has to be geared towards. How do we get back the productivity per truck? Because before, the port was served by about seven, 8,000 trucks. To, to deliver the same number of container vans only with a productivity of 10 to 12, you need 21,000 trucks. Now, where will this come from without it impacting traffic? Okay, so the, here are the recommendations just very quickly. Um, we are trying to, to work with catchy, catchy uh, headlines, you know, so we say ban all bans. Do away with the ban as much as possible. Uh, we also do not uh, really subscribe that the daytime truck ban uh, imposed by the city of Manila really started it all. We believe it went back a little bit uh, farther to the, to the past. And one crucial change of regulation was the expansion of the MMDA truck ban by one hour.
This one hour expansion sounds very innocent because you said, what is one hour in the morning, what is one hour in the evening? But in reality, it disrupted the cycle times and it took out almost 50% of the productivity of trucks. That is what started it. Then it was followed by the Christmas uh, truck ban for a couple of hours, which also led to you know, uh, another build up of uh, pressure. That one was followed by the daytime truck ban, and that is when everything uh, really got, uh, got very bad. But I think all of that has to be considered. So ban, ban the bans, or at least go back if you must maintain an MMDA truck ban, if it must be, maybe better if it is not, but if it must be, the short version of that, not the expanded version, which took out most of the uh, productivity. And LTFRB franchise requirements for trucks, I don't want to say anything further because I know that the issue has been already understood and I think it is being addressed and considered by government. Then another thing, re remove the expiration of gate passes and delivery orders. Every midnight these gate passes are expiring. They are mainly there to protect shipping lines for the collection of the mortgage charges up, the, up to the last possible moment. So there are endless recalculations of that and I, we, we estimate that it adds about one to two days of, uh, of delay in the process of the delivery of, uh, of containers. The only thing which needed to be done is for the shipping lines to charge the last day as detention and not the mortgage and then you can do away with that. Then government to review and possibly regulate so reactivation of a ship's council allowable demolition detention charges. Uh, we fully understand also the position of uh, Secretary Almendras not to regulate wherever possible, but you also have to look a little bit at the history of shipping lines and until a few years ago you did have legitimate cartels, the so-called uh, conferences, and it was acceptable throughout the world. This has changed in the meantime, but we feel sometimes that there are still remnants of that, because uh, if you have a cost for a container lease per day of uh, 2 to $3, dollar, and you are charging $20, $30, $40 a day, uh, you know, you may, you may be tempted to ask, uh, is the market there really working or not? Huh? Okay, then I think that was one of the last one. Thank you. Promote the upgrading of equipment in the secondary ports. Batangas is full right now. It's already full. It is as congested as uh, ATI and ICTSI, and it has only 2K cranes. Maybe adding one more and uh, a few container, uh, 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 rubber tight con uh, container cranes will, will do. So thank All you. Right. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Christian and uh, Sean now, but before that, we'd like to recognize Congresswoman uh, Bunoan for a statement. Maraming salamat po, Mr. Chairman, sa Secretary Mendez, and uh, honorable guests and stakeholders. My name is uh, Congresswoman Trisha Bonoan of Manila, and uh, I have this bill in Congress. It is now uh, in uh, the committee level, and it's called Manila Ports and Special Economic Region. And uh, which is described, and I describe this as uh, the permanent solution to the Manila port congestion. The, um, I've heard that uh, you need money to be able to have this uh, capital, co uh, I mean, infrastructure. This bill, this measure, has, um, it, 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 all, it says here that uh, it would construct transportation facilities that are necessary to help decongest traffic in Metro Manila, as well as prevent traffic lost. And um, this uh, bill um, has about uh, 10 billion allocation for this transport, uh, transportation facilities. Three billion may be used to finance the construction of bridges that will connect the North and South Harbor and uh, could construct the flyover port uh, from the port areas to Eslex. And then uh, there, are, uh, there are also reports that Metro Pacific will be the one who will uh, take charge of the port link from uh, the port going to the Eslex. And uh, the remaining four billion may be used to decongest the port we're, in, uh, we're going to relocate the informal settlers so that we'll, there will be more space inside the port. This, uh, this bill 
also will give voice to all of the stakeholders in uh, the port because uh, MP Sarah uh, is uh, an, uh, a body. We will create a body that is uh, being represented by the PPA as the head of uh, MP Sarah and then three representatives coming from the port that would be uh, one from uh, the port operators, another from uh, representative coming from uh, customs, brokers, truckers, workers, and other established organization in the port, and uh, another uh, representative coming from the workforce. And uh, MMDA will also be part of this MP Sera, including uh, uh, the NCRPO instead of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. So um, this bill will uh, solve two things. One is the traffic congestion in Manila, in Metro Manila, and also two port congestion inside the port. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for giving me this chance. And this bill has uh, funding. PPA has 21 billion pesos retained earnings, and they have cash. In 2013, they told me in the committee hearing, rather budget hearing that was just recently, two months ago, they have cash of uh, 6.1 billion pesos, and that was 2013. Now it's 2014. By now, they have about 7.5 billion pesos cash, which could be used to build bridges within uh, the port to connect the north and the south harbor, and also to construct flyovers from the port going to NLEX and another one going to SLEX. Um, and uh, ang pakiusap ko lang dito sa bill na to, I know this bill is for the private sector, pero isa lang ang pakiusap ko, housing for the poor, so that uh, ma-decongest. Ang um, magkaroon ng space doon sa loob ng port, and also scholarship for the poor. For your manpower supply, we will teach them, we will not only give them money or housing, we will also teach them how to fish. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman, and we'll appreciate a draft of that bill also for our committee. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we'll, we'll go Christian and then Sean. And then um, uh, Teddy and uh, Louis. No. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, we we certainly um, support the the initiative for for the housing the proper housing for the informal settlers. I think it's a great idea. Um, obviously, the the roads uh, that Richard, myself, and, and Sean have talked about excellent idea, but very long term, as as um, Michael has mentioned. Um, Another thing Michael mentioned was the physical capacity of the ports, which are present and, 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 and certainly sufficient, assuming that regulatory and road capacity is managed correctly. One of the ways to manage road capacity and what I want to contribute in terms of solutions, and we discussed this with Secretary Abaya yesterday, is the implementation of a world-class uh, appointment and booking system. Um, we have an opportunity today. National government support is there, trucking support is there, support from the terminal operators are there, support from the all the private sector and the port authority is there. We, we have an opportunity, Senator, to really put in something that is world class, that will make our logistics, uh, which will improve our logistics chain, and which will really put us on the map as far as innovation goes. So I highly rec recommend that, that uh, we push this with MMDA um, and, and all the cities within Metro Manila to support elimination of all truck bans in uh, to be replaced by a 24-hour appointment system, which spreads the load 24-7, which increases 
uh, capacity dramatically, which unlocks the physical capacity that we have unused in the ports. If we do this, not only do we benefit everybody in trade, we also put ourselves on the map, uh, as I said, in terms of um, infrastructure technology, not information technology, but infrastructure technology. Thank you. That was actually what I was going to propose as well, because right now uh, we talk about uh, traffic congestion within the port. If you'll notice in the past three weeks, the free-flowing um, uh, uh, truck flow has been very, very good, all the way from uh, Buendia in the past, all the way to Moriones. The issue now is above the R10 road. What we've seen is that the, the clients want to come in, but they cannot come in because of these external areas. We have talked about the vehicle booking system. This will now um, eliminate those that are just parking on the queues within the, the, the port facility. And we, we've seen that this is a lot. What we're looking at is a place where trucks probably would um, uh, uh, be accumulated and post. And maybe uh, as um, Congressman, a Congresswoman had mentioned, if there's a big space within that facility that could be cleared up, that could actually become a like the truck uh, uh, transit system, I mean the, the bus transit system that's being done. And then all the trucks that will come in will only come in if they have a transaction. And this will also eliminate this issue about corruption. Because as Christian was saying, there has to be no more uh, in interaction with the, the, the whoever, manual. This will actually do that. A guy comes in and he will just go in the gate because he has a schedule. And again, I would echo what was said. This will only work with total lifting of truck ban. And on the contrary, the fear of putting a truck ban and removing it will actually be negated because now this would actually not need any more truck bans. Now, if, 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 if I may just um, um, make a comment to Mike's um, statement of Batangas. It's true, we've been uh, having very good um, volumes. And in fact, it's uh, gone up for the past uh, couple of weeks. But what I'd like to appeal is that the same um, exercise we're trying to do, uh, do in Manila, we should do the same in Batangas. Because believe me, the dwell times now in Batangas, when it used to be three and four, is now 13 days. So what we're doing is simply replicating Manila and bring it there. The two key cranes and the four RTGs and the 12 hectare area is more than sufficient to handle the volume that's coming in now. Because we, we have to understand, Batangas is not meant for Manila cargo. And Manila, as you said, is sufficient. Batangas will operate efficiently for the Calab or at least the Labarzon cargo, right? But it will not be efficient if, in fact, well, all we're doing is the same thing we're doing to Manila. So I think we have to qualify that. Uh, Real quickly. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just in addition to what uh, they have said about the vehicle bo booking system, since this will be a web-based uh, system, uh, all the stakeholders can have a view and, uh, of, of the transactions. So they would, the, the exporters and the importers would know when the containers are destined to be in the, inside the port or when they can take delivery of the, of the containers. So by, by doing this, you, you can eliminate the opportunities for, for corruption also. Thank you. Uh, Teddy and then Louis. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Well, with regards to the uh, short and the long, long-term transport plan that we're talking about, uh, I would like to mention that LLTFRB has done the short term by um, extending the, um, the PAs and the application of uh, CPSs. But we would like to put in line, as far as the, the transport plan is concerned, is that the exclusion of the trucks in, uh, in uh, getting franchises, because we do believe that uh, we cannot be classified as uh, just uh, like uh, on, on, the, on the lines of the jeeps, the buses, and the trucks, because we're not dealing with with uh, the public in general. And uh, if I may so, I would like to um, to pass the mic to uh, Attorney Louie to explain further about uh, the system. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Teddy. Um, Mr. Chair, um, 
I think one thing has to be clear with the truckers. We are not against any form of regulation. We are just after a form of regulation that is conducive to all sectors. In our case, the issuance of a CPC yields no tangible, we believe at least, no tangible benefit to any sector of society. In fact, it hinders trade because uh, we'll, we'll have to dedicate probably months of months in a year just to take care of our CPC application. And then when we have that piece of paper and our yellow plates, what benefit do trucks have? Does the LTFRB, with all due respect to the agency, um, do they have the manpower to regulate the trucks on top of the passenger vehicles, which we believe is more deserving of that regulation? The trucks actually bargain with importers more or less on a level basis. It was only an, during this crisis when the demand far outweighed the supply where you would see truckers uh, somehow catching up to the bargaining power of the importers. That has rarely been the case. And uh, when, the, uh, when the crisis is over, when the market balances itself, we'll find uh, that uh, trucks will be again at a disadvantage. Uh, we are not, um, we're not uh, strictly uh, revolting against that idea. It's just that we submit that uh, it's something that the private sector uh, can handle by itself. So uh, when looking towards a long-term solution, we were hoping, we are hoping that uh, the Ken Senator and the uh, Congress in general can have a review of this law and see that there is actually no tangible benefit in its implementation and it will actually help to further facilitate uh, trade port, uh, and de decrease or do away with port congestion because we think that we can sit here all day and uh, legislate and anything other than CPCs but if you come January 31 when thousands of trucks will be again considered colorum, we will just be undoing all the work that we have done in the past few months. And lastly, uh, Senator, just to mention that um, the at the current rate, I believe January 31 will not even be enough because, uh, for one, uh, the issuance of a CPC, so I understand, uh, subject to a hearing. So there are not even enough days to accommodate those number of applicants. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to request the OTC for a position on that as well. We will, uh, yes, sir, and we will coordinate with LTFRB also. Yes, um, so we'd like to see a position of LTFRB or the OTC regarding that matter. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, quickly. Uh, yes, quickly. Sir, we, we have a position paper submitted actually to the DOTC, the LTFRB, and the LTO. Uh, we'd like to ask permission if we can also submit uh, something to the same effect with this committee. Of Thank course. You. Thank you, Chair. Yes, but uh, I'd be interested to see the uh, official comments of DOTC on the matter. Okay, we're, we're going to go for a final round because we've yeah. terribly uh, over time already. Yeah. Who are interested to give a few words? So we have Ernie. Yes, so we have Congresswoman first, and then Ernie, and then we'll have Kabsek as the last word. So, Congresswoman. Again, marami salamat po, Mr. Senator. And I would like to take this opportunity to uh, for the stakeholders to study and peruse uh, uh, House Bill 4312 as uh, the one uh, amended by the TWG, that's uh, the group uh, in Congress. This uh, House bill is known as Manila Ports and Special Economic Region. And the under, and I would like to humbly request for a letter of support if you think this will really help you uh, address to the Speaker of uh, the House, Congressman, the or Honorable Congressman Feliciano Belmonte, praying that uh, HB 4312, as amended during TWG, as urgent bill, to be passed by Congress. Marami salamat po. Thank you, Congresswoman. Ernie? Very short. I want us to heed the call of uh, Senator Kino and actually the President Aquino about the private sector's involvement because even this uh, LTFRB, uh, we have time and motion study experts. And for me, what has failed here 
is that we've not gotten the private sector, especially the management experts, to get involved in this. So I'd like us to continue. I'd like to part by saying the following. Not only thank you to you, Senator Gino. Thank you to Secretary Almendras and the Cabinet, because ever since you had that hearing and we've been involved with them, they've been extremely open. My only plea is that the rest have the same attitude as you and Secretary Almendras, because there are some who resist any private sector suggestions. But I see there's good and bad private sector. We must allow good private sector to come in, and we must fight the smugglers. Okay. Um, Kabsek, you have the final word from a uh, quite a terribly long hearing here, you know, but... I worry when, when uh, former Secretary Dorius paints me as a monster that seems to be able to uh, force people to do things they otherwise don't like to do. May, may I respond to some of the suggestions, Your Honor, just briefly, just to assure people that uh, the Aquino administration wants to solve problems. One, on the truck dispatch system, Chris... Uh, Sean, myself, and a few of us have been dreaming about this since, uh, I think, April was the first time we discussed it. Uh, just to reinforce the point, and I'm sorry I need to say this so that we need to put it on record so that the local governments who are very mad at me <laughs> will understand that we, on certain days, we have moved a lot more cargo in and out of the port than ever done before. There were days when we did 40% more than what was being moved even prior to the truck ban. And we did not cause traffic, Your Honor. Okay, so I'm sorry, I just need to put that on record because until today, I'm still getting tremendous resistance from certain sectors and local governments on that. We can solve the problem without creating traffic. And the truck dispatch system, yes, is the long-term solution. Number two... Tomorrow, as part of the agenda, is already the connector road, which has been discussed months in basis, and it's primarily one of the reasons why the contention was, why are you going to have two connector roads that will connect NLEX and XLEX? And the primary reason for that is because we wanted to solve the truck movement problem in the port of Manila. That, that, it's not true that we're trying to favor two business groups or what. No, there is a reason for one connector road, and there's the other reason for the other connector road, merely by the location of the other connector roads. So we're, we're, it's, it's in the agenda tomorrow. What has not been mentioned is rail. Okay, and I have asked the OTC and PNR and everyone else officially that we must reinvigorate the rail system into the ports of Manila because it will solve so much and we will be able to handle two, three times the present capacity way 10, 15 years into the future if we l use the rail. Why? Because if, when we can load containers on rail to move th them in and out of the metropolis, then you're getting rid of so much traffic. Imagine how many trucks you get out for every train that you can push through. And the whole world has taught us that rail is a very good way to handle cargo. And I think we should really follow on that. Finally, um, Your Honor, regarding the bill of uh, Congresswoman Bonoan, it has often been asked, what is the longer term solution? One of the things we learned in this problem is that a very myopic view of solving the problem cannot happen. It needs to be a broad understanding of the problem. When we were tweaking around with the 24-hour truck lane, we were so confident it was going to solve it, we all let our guard down and said, okay now, because that's what happened during the WEF. If you remember, uh, I met with Mayor President Estrada in, in Manila Hotel, and, you know, in 30 minutes we got him to agree, but we thought that was going to solve. But then we didn't realize that there were other problems that followed. And admittedly, with the uh, 37 meetings that we've had on this topic, not including this one, Mr. Senator, every meeting we uncover a new complexity. If there is an advantage to a holistic view, it's really the view that the port of Manila is very critical, not just to the country, but actually to Manila. Manila became a city. Manila progressed as a destination, mainly because the port was there. And that's how all the great cities of the world were born, because the port was there. So the solution is not to kick out the port, but to improve on its efficiency. And so we are, we're very open to any idea that creates a holistic and total approach to solving the problem. And uh, finally, Your Honor, uh, we thank the private sector who have been very cooperative. Uh, we even thank those who have not been cooperating because they have also taught us many lessons <laughs> in life. Um, it helps us understand the complexities. The, 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 what was 
highlighted on media last night was that government is insisting that the port congestion problem is over. We never said that, Your Honor. No government official ever said tapos na ang problema. As a matter of fact, uh, at 2.30 this afternoon, there's a TWG meeting near here where I'm going to have all the stakeholders in government again, hopefully uh, the last time we met, we met for over three hours. But we acknowledge the fact that this is a problem that is uh, not going to be solved immediately. Uh, what we are saying is that the main issue of movements in the ports have already been resolved. Okay? The ports are moving a lot more containers than ever, even before the truck ban was imposed. So there, that is what we're saying. But as far as the totality of the problem is concerned, I've already said the problem is no longer technical. The problem is price. Um, you know, uh, LC is very aggressive uh, uh, in pushing the issues. We are fully supportive of that. We are looking for ways and means. Uh, we are doing legal studies. Uh, there are options on how to limit uh, charging of, uh, of certain people on certain things. There is the DOJ option. I'm sure you're familiar with that option, Your Honor, on competition and fair trade. But that, to me, is a nuclear bomb solution, which is not ideal unless absolutely necessary, because that's when we start taking people to, to task for, for pricing. The ideal solution is that hopefully private sectors continued vigilance and continued uh, outspokenness and uh, ability to provide data and information will really help temper some of the things. I do not, and I will repeat for the sake of media, government never said na tapos ng problema. We have solved the big problem. Now we're trying to solve all the other corollary problems that have come out because we have solved the big problem. But in no way are we saying that uh, tapos na. We will continue to work. Uh, the cabinet cluster is committed to to work on this, and we will finish this hopefully before the end of the term of President Aquino. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Kabsek, and um, I guess that uh, sums up best no, what we're trying to achieve here. I'd like to thank everyone for their cooperation. Um, it seems that once you join the hearing, you're committed to cooperate with uh, all of the measures that need to be done. So we need to get maybe the other stakeholders on board also, not the ones that we feel are not cooperating as much, but we'd like to Wish everyone the best, and um, we'll tackle some of these other issues. No, and uh, I won't repeat them again because Kabzek really summed it up very well. But I uh, apologize for going one hour over time, but um, it just goes to show that everyone is really adamant in solving this issue, and that's a good thing. No, so maraming salamat, magandang hapon sa ating lahat.